All right, and we are live. Yeah. How's everyone doing today? It's going to be a, a good one, I think. Come in the chat and say hi as you arrive. I have another drink today, pinkish in color, but it is not coconut water. It is blood orange Italian soda. Hmm, it's good. Yeah, no, I not coconut water this time. It's the delay getting you. How's it going, Greg? Uh, yeah. Interesting last couple days, eh, on the, on the Twitter. People discovering what benchmarks are without discovering what benchmarks shouldn't be. We'll talk about that a bit later. Um, hey. Hey. Hey, David. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we're going to give people a couple minutes. Actually, I'm going to go on Twitter right now and tell people that we are we are live now because I think people will want to tune in and check this out because this is not information you can get anywhere. I mean, technically, um, you can go use this framework every day when you, you know, open up your Chrome browser and go to your Google search or actually, I guess, suppose any browser, but, um, I, th I think it's very interesting to kind of get a peek at, you know, the difference between what we do sometimes at hobbyist devs that we do in enterprise situations or, you know, what happens at, you know, arguably one of the biggest web companies in the world. So this is, this is pretty cool. Let me see if I, sorry, I should share my screen here for a second. Just going to put that up. Um, where are we? Um, yeah, streams back. That's why people can get past their Twitch preloads. We're live. Oh, we're live. Um, yeah, I'm going to do the, tw I'm going to give the, the Twitch link because I think it's more interactive there. Maybe why, why do I never remember my Twitch link? You guys probably can correct me in the chat. Ryan Solid, yeah, Twitch TV Ryan Solid, yeah. All right, let's get this going. Cool. But, yeah, okay, hi from Canada. Hey. I reach out to you about being an invited expert. I don't know what that means. But I guess not. Oh, the TC39 proposal? Yeah, yeah, I... I We'll talk a bit about that today. I don't know if I want to talk too much of the details of the proposal itself, um, but we've been involved right from basically the beginning. Yeah. Um, I heard Solid is slower than React. Yeah. 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 Well, Twitch people are people to no, the, I actually use the StreamYard chat, so I see both sides. The only thing that I miss in this situation is I don't get to see um, the subs. So I always have to come over. So when people here are so gracious enough to sub to the channel, sometimes, you know, or gift subs in large numbers, you know, if you're in the Twitch chat and I haven't, like, shouted it out, do let me know um, because I, I don't actually see the sub announcements, right? So that's the only thing. Sometimes I switch back and forth just so I can see the sub announcements. But yeah, we're, we're we're starting to get rolling, but we're still a little bit slow here. So let's 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 get some more people coming in here. I don't. Yeah, yeah. There there is a public. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. There's a, here it is. There is a public Discord. Chat more about the TC39 proposal. There is also a private Discord too, which is another thing. I I only just joined the public one. Um, hey Johnny. There's actually a signals discord. Um, I don't know if I could just, I think everyone's in, is everyone invited to that one? There's a, there's like a hundred and some odd people in there right now, which is different than the other discord that only has 23 people in it. We could talk about, we'll, we'll talk about the signals thing in a bit because it's part, I think it ties into the narrative of what we're going to talk about today, right? <laughs> signals one use the platform. Uh, I'll hold judgments on that, you know, 
I mean, does that mean Web Components won? Um, so, yeah, and I, I yeah. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, similarly, yes. Uh, let's get this out here right now in the first little bit. Likes help the video's viewership immensely. The more people who like the video, the more it gets shown to people. Like, the, the, there's, there's completely a correlation here, like considerable difference in viewership from the number of likes. Uh, I'll, you know, I'd say even more than comments. All right, all right. There we go. Okay, so we got about eighty people here now. So we're now we can actually get started. I I, I wasn't going to start until we we got over that that threshold. All right, all right. Um, good. You know, I didn't want to uh, waste Jadon's time. Um, not that there isn't going to be a, a live video that you can check out for you know months to come, but let's 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 make let's make this fun because we have a live guest here today. Um, and we should make the most of it, especially with his expertise um, working on Wiz, which is, I mean, he'll explain it better, but is a framework, internal framework to Google that's been used to build some of the biggest um, projects um, that you've, you've probably used, things like Google Search, Google Photos. And, uh, you know, it, it, I know this always been a little confusing to me because you're like, oh, Angular, the Google framework. Well, Angular is a Google framework, um, but it doesn't necessarily build some of the heaviest traffic um, sites, at least traditionally. But for a lot of you out there and people who are familiar with Angular, you, the first you might have even heard of Wiz was when the Angular team announced that um, their efforts were merging, which is huge news. Um, especially if you know what Wiz is. So I feel like we, we all got to like catch up a little bit. Um, and who better to catch us up than a core maintainer Jadon? Um, I'm going to invite him on the stream now and actually ah, see this. I'm, I'm, I'm so disarray. I, I'm sorry. See, while I'm talking, I'm supposed to put up this banner and I was just like being really slow. Sorry, Jadon. Welcome. Hey. Yeah, how are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Ryan? I'm okay. But yeah, I think the big question, um, I just want to get just right out, right out of the gate is like, so people know why we're here. Can you just tell me really briefly, we'll get into more detail later. Like what is Wiz? I just tried my best here, but w w tell me what is Wiz and why should we care? Sure. Um, so Wiz is a web framework that's been used to build a lot of Google products. Um, it's a pretty old framework. It's been around for about 10 years now. Um, and I think it's interesting because unlike other web frameworks, Wiz actually took SSR extremely seriously right from the start. And so the reason for that was because we wanted extremely fast response times. So when you go to a page, you should immediately be able to see some content in the first round trip. And so that makes Wiz interesting and uh, slightly different from how other frameworks have approached this. And, and now, of course, there's like really good support for SSR in other frameworks as well. But there are still like a few nuances that are different. And I think they're interesting to like talk about. Definitely, well, definitely. Yeah, no, that's that, that's that's very cool. Yeah, because you said about 10 years ago. Yeah. So I guess just like putting in my timeline of frameworks, Wiz probably came up about around the same time, uh, like Marco at eBay came out. You got, I, I, I'm not surprised that some larger companies at that time were looking at solutions for this problem as the interactivity scaled up. Do you, do you know, just out of curiosity, do you know what Google was using before Wiz to kind of solve these problems? Uh, so there are a lot of, uh, Wiz kind of organically emerged from a lot of internal kind of libraries and technologies that existed at Google. Like one of the interesting technologies that uh, has been written about publicly is called MSS or Module Set Serving. Right. Um, you could actually find some information about it on GitHub uh, from like five years ago. Um, maybe I can like actually share a link. Do you want me to kind of grab that? Yeah. You? If you want, if you if you want, if you want to take a minute to grab that, that's cool. I think people. Might be might be a little bit at least interested to get the framing for this, just yeah. because, like I understand, like 
a lot of these systems, and it's still to this day, like even if parts of the stuff go, go public, there's a whole private specific infrastructure at these larger companies. Like the way you use Re React audience is different than the way Meta uses React and the build step and all the pieces. Same thing with eBay. There's a whole bunch of other infrastructure little pieces to kind of serve stuff up at that scale. Yeah. But, okay. Uh, I, I dropped the link. Um, can you see. share it the best way? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and I'm going to actually pop it up on the screen for a moment. As I said, we probably don't have a ton of uh, of, yes. uh, of so, these things to show off. But yeah, okay, what, what, what am I looking at? So this is like from like a while back, right? And it starts talking about like dynamic bundling and like it actually tries to introduce like, you know, what... And, and you have to remember, this is from five years ago, right? Like, you know, I know that state of the art kind of keeps advancing really fast. Uh, and so some of this stuff might like already make sense um, in other ways, maybe. Uh, but right. uh, but yeah. So you asked me like, what was Google using before Wiz? And like, I guess this this is used by Wiz, but this existed before Wiz as well. And this wasn't created just for Wiz. Uh, it's essentially this system by which you can chop up your JavaScript files into many many small pieces. And some large Google products can have thousands of entry points. Uh, we're not talking about just route level code splitting and like, you know, I have five chunks in my application. We're talking about thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of these chunks and ex very, like, individual components are like different entry points. And when you load an entry point, it doesn't automatically mean that you just loaded that entire sub, like a giant subtree behind it. You actually loaded like whatever is required for interactivity for just that one component. I like um, this term, fine grain chunk splitting. Yeah, we we really played a lot with terms. Like we we kept using module for a long time, and then that caused all kinds of confusion. And then like we kind of settled on chunks now. <laughs> right. Yeah. So basically, the goal here is mostly at figuring out how to limit the JavaScript that was delivered until either you needed it or what was used on the page or whatever. This is this is very advanced code splitting and lazy loading. If mm -hmm. uh, it's not just about limiting it. It's also about controlling when you actually load it. Right. Um, and so if you go to like google.com you, you, and then you search for something, you will see a lot of JavaScript being loaded. But what we are very, very intentional about is like when we load it and some of the JavaScript is actually being loaded after the rendering's already happening. And some JavaScript is not loaded unless you actually interact with that particular component because it's like super lazy loaded. Um, so as you can imagine, right? Like see these, these components, they show up on screen uh, depending on your query. So there's like hundreds of these different things. We couldn't possibly just load all of them. Uh, that would be too much JavaScript. Right, yeah. I'm familiar with all these little widgets, like food widgets, mm -hmm. plane flight widgets, yeah. reviews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, just like literally showing my my address on screen. Yeah, all good. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I was trying to, um, but this this um, thing, is this was this actually like, uh, was this an approach or was this actually um, specific like, software so like, th 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 this is us trying to so about five years ago was when um, the Wiz and the angular teams kind of organizationally got really close to each other and the first kind of attempts were made to try to merge the two frameworks gotcha. um, this was back when gosh uh, mishko was also kind of working on angular full-time and he was at google full-time and uh, Mishko and a few other folks, uh, some WSTLs from back then, they got together and they tried to like really study both frameworks. And this is like five years ago, right? So like a lot of stuff that has happened since did not exist. Right. Uh, and back then they concluded that technically the frameworks are like really different from each other. But, um, you know, some of this may have turned into Quake later, like some of the seeds of those <laughs> ideas are now available to everybody as Quake. Right, so that like, makes a lot of sense. I guess, yeah, so I guess what I'm talking about here is like the quick loader and possibly parts of the quick optimizer. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so this we just kind of got an idea here of, about Wiz, but we're going to dig into that more in a minute. I'm, I'm in, I, I think, uh, interested a little bit about you. When, when, did you uh, when did you start at Google? How long have you been involved in this project? I started at Google, I think, about 12 
12 years ago now. Um, I, I joined Google 2000 and gosh, 11. Uh, and I initially joined Google uh, to work on, on G+. Um, and Google Plus was an uh, incredibly large front end uh, and one of the largest apps I think that Google's ever built. Uh, we just kept adding features. Like you, if you recall, like we had this pan, pan, like left hand side tab where you had games and photos and stream, and like it just kept going, right? Like, yeah, um, it's supposed to be so, like fully dynamic, interactive, like kind of next generation social media. I remember uh, getting the early demos into, uh, not demos, but like early. Yeah. I'm not probably not even early, but I remember signing up for like the pre preview version and thinking it was like the coolest thing. And then okay. it, it well, actually, I can't remember. Was there Google Wave as well around that time period, or was that right? Before? Wave was a little bit before. Or oh, right, yeah, 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 yeah. Like and, it was like, and, and, yeah, it's separate. Uh, but you know, um, definitely the ideas kind of fed into it. Like Google was kind of aware. There was also this thing called Orkut for a while. I don't know if a lot of people it was super popular um, in my circles um, and circles. Like yeah, circles was another feature <laughs> in like, plus. Um, and so um, we just kept writing JavaScript, right? Like we're all addicted to JavaScript and like, it's like this uh, 2011, right? Like, you know, the, the, the community in general hadn't like, yeah, I, I don't know, like big JavaScript hadn't taken off yet. Uh, and yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, Backbone, Angular and Knockout were all released the second half of 2010. So like how, like I, I know there's like jQuery and there's probably people work on internal tools that were, you know, maybe more advanced, but like just for timeline period, like it's bit, it's like, okay, we've had backbone for six months or angular for six months. I mean, how far could anyone take it? Right. Um, and so a lot of this code is written using closure closure, not the one with the J, but the closure compiler closure. Right. Um, and so we're still in this world where like, you know, the different browsers are kind of hard to, uh, wrestle and so you really want some kind of abstraction that like you know lets you write the JavaScript once and it works like seamlessly in all the browsers, and so Closure provided a lot of that. Um, and um, and then we needed this foundation of like you know how do I do code splitting right? Because when you have so many features and so many views, if you just rely on like an army of a thousand developers to remember to code split and somehow organize themselves, um, it's challenging, especially when they're moving like really, really fast, right? Like if your app is not changing very fast, like maybe you can kind of impose right. some restrictions and like, you know, control it, but yeah. Cause th these were, th this was like, w were these largely single page app? Like I just like architecture, like trying to remember these things, like were there full, a lot of full page navigations or were there, was there a lot of client stuff at that point? I, I, I don't actually know. G plus was almost entirely like, you know, you, you, the initial render is on the server and then it's all like client side. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Cause that can kind of scale. Cause the thing you get, people got to understand, obviously we're all aware of this now having built large client side apps, but at that point, you know, you didn't, even if you had interactivity, you didn't notice the same kind of scale problems like stuff. Like uh, I talked about eBay, eBay was e-commerce. They didn't really do client side routing. They just loaded pages. They just want to get that shop page up as fast as possible. The teams are able to work independently largely because they each had their own page. I mean, the teams are huge and then the ads and like there's a whole bunch of cross cutting. But generally speaking, I always considered like if you had to do client side or had to treat it as like a single app, like how much harder does that get to in terms of managing all the people and all the like deployment, all the infrastructure around that just because there's like so many people kind of maybe touching on same so, places. Yeah. So, so the way that it becomes very visceral is, um, you know, you're trying to, if you're also trying to do like daily pushes, right? So yep. like you want a new version of your application cause you're like, you know, moving so fast, you want to compete and like, and what happens is, is you do, you try to get your, you make a build, right? You, you do a release cut, you try to get it to production, like a staging environment and, right. uh, oh, something's wrong. Uh, and so you got to like now go and cherry pick a fix or like, you know, the whole build gets rolled back because uh, one particular feature was wrong because you're deploying it as a monolith. And so you yeah. have a shared fate right. and uh, you do this back and forth a few times. And then now suddenly you missed your schedule. You're not, you're no longer like doing daily pushes, right? Yeah. Um, and so I remember we had like a core team that would actually like, you know, try to push a new version every day. And like back then they were also like manually, like trying to stare at all these graphs, trying to figure out like, is something throwing more errors or not? 
uh, and then uh, trying to decide if you want to like just roll out to 100%. And the shared fate problem was pretty severe. Uh, right. A lot of teams could not actually just finally come together and every everybody gets everything right. Because that's what it takes to like just push a new version of your server out there and, and roll it up to 100% of your fleet. Yeah, no, th that seems challenging. I, I know, like, obviously, micro front end esque solutions kind of come into play, but I, I feel like when micro front ends at least were introduced to me, a lot of the solutions out there, I look at them and I'm like, there's no way that's like efficient. Like, there's got to be like, like the, the performance seems like it'd be, you know, a concern. So I, I'm gathering, like, you, you got, it's had to take that on head on pretty, pretty early here. Yeah. Um, so one of the first things we kind of did was we said that, you know, there should be like this clear separation between like your rendering layer and your data layer. And, and, and 2010, 2011, like we also kind of, I mean, I guess uh, phones had existed for like two or three years, but like it wasn't as ubiquitous as it is right now. So um, what had happened is we had a whole bunch of these like HTTP endpoints, API routes, I guess you would call them. And they're all in the same server. Like there's this one server that's serving all your HTML and like, you know, your, your web traffic and the same server has all these API routes. That's getting unmanageable, right? right. And so we said, so no, we should go to split it up. And then the API routes should somehow be shared, right? Like for, by, by your Android, iOS and web. Right, right. Okay, yeah, and that's interesting too because each of them, will also have their own UIs, right? Or I don't know, the only reason I'm mentioning this is because I, 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 and again, I don't know how much this is like Google hush hush or not, but I just know like at Meta and I know at eBay, they, they've created these services that would almost like try and describe um, the UI through an API level so that they could like have the API return the dynamic a like UI based on like the device, but can I like unify it somehow? I don't know, I'm gathering you guys probably did played around with some stuff like that as well. I, I don't know, just. Yeah, uh, of course we did and we continue to, uh, but I think that's like kind of outside the scope. Okay. Here, here we want to talk about just like web. We want to talk about, we like HTML, right? right. Like we, we want, we want to, we want to write HTML. And right. uh, so uh, that kind of like server driven UI approach is, is interesting, but um, you know, if you're passionate about a platform, you want to natively build on it. Right. Because that's how you can be most efficient for that specific yeah. platform. Right. Which I guess gets us a little bit back to Wiz now, because mm -hmm. that's obviously what came out of it. Um, yeah. Can you talk a bit about the, the, the beginnings of Wiz? So I wasn't like on the framework team. So like, you know, you put it perfectly. I'm the Wiz maintainer. I wasn't actually part of the core team when the framework was first created. Um, right. I kind of started joining, I joined Wiz about like five years ago. Um, okay. And so um, before that, right, like, so Wiz kind of emerged from like, okay, so now we've separated our API routes and like, we need this system by which, you know, we can kind of fetch the data and then use it to render something on the server side. And then on the client side, and this is where it gets like super interesting. We don't want uh, a full page hydration pass. Because this is key, right? Like when you are trying to do hydration, um, you end up loading the, the rendering code for components that may not have actually rendered on the page. Because on the server side, when you fetch the data from this API route, you, you ran some control flow and you decided, oh, because the user made this query, I'm going to show like this. Uh, so it's like, can you imagine it's like this giant switch statement and you decide which component to render based on like, you know, the query yeah. that the user sent in. And you cannot load like you know you have like 500 components. You rendered one of them. You don't want to load. You don't want to load like 499 components just because you got to hydrate the page. Um, and so right. you have this need to like load only what's actually rendered. And so that's where Wiz comes in. Um, Wiz says that every component is an entry point, and then when the user interacts with the page, we're going to uh, have this like event delegation system that will uh, decide what component to load based on the part of the page that the user uh, interacted with. Gotcha. Uh, now, of course, like actually late loading it that much is not super great for the UX because sometimes some things are important. So like as soon as you know that it's rendered, you want to like preload it, right? Right. And so at that point, this event delegation system isn't actually loading it, but it is instantiating like a component only when the user interacts with it. So you don't eagerly right. instantiate and attach event listeners. 
you just have this delegation library that's waiting. Um, right. So I guess the act of like natively attaching an event listener is is deferred till the user actually interacts with that component. Uh, okay. I mean, I, I obviously have questions. Um, I don't know whether I should ask those questions now or if we can go a little bit further. Mostly, you said the, the, the it was that last statement about the event handlers not like the, there must have been some kind of like global event handler, right? Like, it's like because if someone goes to do something, like yeah. you know, goes to click, you at that point you have to be like, okay, someone's clicked over here. Yeah, I know I need to do something. So some something had to be listening. Um, yes, and so there's just this one kind of global event listener and it's listening at the root and that the, the the javascript for that is literally inlined into the page right right yeah so that way there's like you know just like you would like inline css to prevent a flash of unstyled content you just inline this javascript before you know you start like at the very top so that way as your page is streaming technically if you're on a really bad connection your page hasn't finished streaming and you yeah. have like half a page hanging out there you could interact with that as well if you wanted to right yeah, I imagine streaming has been part of the solution here right from the beginning, like streaming consideration. Um, yeah, you, you, you just don't have a page with that talks to dozens of services without streaming. Otherwise, you know, stuff would get really bottlenecked. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, yeah, let, let's see here. I, there's a question from chat that was, do you have to mark your components with use client? I, I think people want to, understand a little bit more i mean i know wiz has been evolving on the on the dx side but maybe we can talk about like the 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 kind of principles but towards how you approach um you already said like high level what it does but like what principles how do you approach like say authoring or how you approach like actually uh like breaking these responsibilities apart because it's it, it seems kind of tricky you know like use client is a perfect example of you know uh I islands architecture type thing i know server components but the same conceptually this is a little bit different um it, it kind of is um and and this is actually like one of the dx challenges of of really embracing this philosophy of like you know you you don't want to load any javascript that's not actually required um so uh, funny enough, <laughs> I mean, I, I, I guess it's fine. You, you don't have to mark your components in Wiz with use client. Instead, you have to mark them with something called at Pinto Mario. <laughs> it's like maybe the Googlers who are listening will get it. But the point is, like, you have to tell the, the bundler, essentially, that, hey, this is an entry point. Uh, and, and this entry point contains a collection of event listeners and all these event listener, event handlers, and all these event handlers should be attached to this HTML element when the user interacts with them. And, and these are the events that I care about, right? So one of the, so these event handlers are super fiddly because right away, one of the big problems that you have is you somehow need to know what are the event handlers in that component, right? So, so our components are classes uh, and, and they still are. And so you have like all these methods in your class and like you need to know which of the like what are the events that that you care about. And then you need to actually say in the, I guess, template, right, that you're rendering on the server side. Oh, uh, here's a list of events. So we can actually look at some of this if you like bring up Google.com or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, yeah, that, that, that's, we had it already up. Let me let me see if I can get back to sharing my screen. Yeah, let's do it. Right. So just like this first page, is this fine? Should I? Uh, no, like, yeah, maybe. Is this like the new tab page? Maybe search. get into, I don't know, search for kittens or something. Kittens, uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Now you start seeing JS action right there. Um, JS body, model, JS model, JS, JS, JS controller, controller, and JS action. So JS con controller is component, right? Like JS controller, just think it's JS component, right? That's a component. Okay. Okay. Uh, and that that string there, right? That string is like a reference, like JS controller equals, what is that? EXO39D. That is an obfuscated name of a component. right? And that is a, also a reference to the entry point that you should load because that entry point contains, you know, uh, a number of those uh, JS actions that are there right after it. So yeah, I'm, uh, I, it's not like I'm gonna find an EX whatever JS file, am I? I don't think so, no. Okay. Just <laughs> Okay, a little yeah. bit too optimistic. Okay, let's keep going. Um, and so some of these JS actions will actually be um, handled by that controller. 
And any JS action that's not handled by that controller is likely handled. Oh, this is on the body. So this it should all be handled by the body controller there. Right. If you like scroll down, like maybe dig into something. Um, so like on the page. If we can get into. Let's see. OK, so you see there, right there. Um, that's like another example of a JS controller. That's like the component, right? And then the JS action, if the JS action is not handled by that controller, uh, then that yeah. even dispatch library is going to keep traveling up the DOM till it finds a JS controller that will actually handle the JS action. And and so you can see there's like many JS controllers at different levels of the DOM. Yeah, yeah. And, and they could handle JS actions either on the same element or something that's below them. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Interesting. So basically, you kind of encode the concept of um, component or, I guess, controller, like, and the concept of is the action like the event like yeah yeah uh, uh, of the event onto it mm -hmm. i also see some other fun ones like js name and G i don't know that's just model and and so yeah. wiz initially was mvc like this is again 2011 mvc i think was all the rage we, i don't even think we had mvvc or any of those more advanced things yet um and so wiz is an mvc architecture and um, it's kind of working for us, but you know, it's it's not like the world's kind of moved on a little bit, so it, it can be a little unfamiliar at, at times. But a model is supposed to be like heavier than a controller. Right. Controller is supposed to be like super lightweight, and then a controller just kind of handles the UI, right? It's it's just trying to change the view, and then like for state management, it's supposed to go up top of the model. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's. Yeah, controller, action, model. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of getting getting a picture here, um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm just, like this is this is basically the output side, right? So like this is, I, I okay, I guess my question is, okay, let's say we we have an action, we perform. Let's say uh, this is this is the link isn't a good example here because it'll just navigate me to another um, page. There should be accordions if you scroll down a little bit. Yeah, or things that expand out. Yeah, accordion. Yeah, the expo yeah. yeah. Or view all. Further. Or view all actually is a new page too, isn't it? Uh, yeah, there you go. People also ask. People also ask. Yeah. This is an interesting one because when you click that, right, and now collapse it again, you notice there's more items at the list at the bottom. Yeah. So what's interesting is you're interacting with a component, and that component needs to go back up and tell something above it. Hey, by the way, load more things at the bottom. Huh. And so a lot of stuff needs to be orchestrated. It's not just opening that one thing. I, I guess what I was kind of curious about is assuming that this doesn't do, you know, eager hydration. Mm -hmm. I load the page, I scroll a bit. When I click on this, and I, I'm going to assume the JS is preloaded or, you know, when I scroll, there's some triggers. I'm sure you guys optimize for that kind of stuff. I'm just curious, like, what the execution actually looks like um, when when this happens like because d does does it hydrate then like 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 uh, you, you get what i'm getting at like does yeah. it then go okay what did i render i mean this is a bad example because it's showing new stuff but like did it does it like I, it's hard because it's only a click event i'm trying to like you, you know what i mean like there's a situation where you have a data table um and you then scroll and you you know, there's a calculator yeah. in here. I, I've seen it before. You, yeah, you know, what I, like one plus one. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. Up, yeah. And like, assuming like when you then go press the button to do an addition or change a number or something, yeah. and it it will load the code. Like, how how does the rendering happen? I'm just kind of gotcha. curious. Yeah. So, um, so this is this is maybe you know I want to tie this back to like you know why we have two frameworks in Angular, right? Like for for very, very interactive, uh, like things like, you know, a map or like, you know, um, like a calculator, it, it, the internals of a, cal even a calculator is actually fairly declarative. Uh, but anything that's like super interactive, it, having your event handlers always use this JS action thing can get a little tedious. And so to answer your question, right, in the strictest, by the strictest definition, Wiz never hydrates. What that means is even after the first time the JS action has triggered, we're not attaching an event listener directly to that element. We're always going through JS action. Right. So you delegate it. And what you're saying is, like, 
Wiz, it, I guess we didn't clarify this earlier. Is Wiz a rendering framework or just like the controlling mechanism here? Because like, like, do you guys render these pages in JavaScript on the server or in something else? Ooh, interesting. So um, I guess Wiz is this uh, part that we've discussed so far, but it does have a first class like templating language. Um, it's called Closure Templates. Uh, and we use closure templates because the probably one of the biggest reasons is because it also compiles to Java and we render in Java servers, not in JavaScript servers. And in that way, we are very, very different from, uh, you know, most of the community out there. Gotcha. Okay. So templating renders to, uh, compiles to Java, mm -hmm. render everything in Java on the server, mm -hmm. then Wiz doesn't hydrate per mm -hmm. se, but like, when it, you, you, you get where I'm getting at. Like yeah, so, when, when a change happens, do you just blow it up and replace it? Do so, you... so those JS names, you were asking about the JS names. Yeah. One thing that you could do is you could look up an element using the JS name and then go change it imperatively, right? JQuery right. style. Right. Um, I mean, to be fair, Marco in version one, two, and three, like pre-2015 was like this as well. That's why I, I'm kind of, they called it like Marco widgets. This is why I'm just... Okay. I'm kind of pick classically, it, as I said, the, the, I'm getting the impression this is like a controlling mechanism so that like it handles all the loading, make sure the right events handle, but then like the rendering stuff is something you guys have been working on developing more over time. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. So, so the very initial version, it's like, you know, here's, here's a JS action. If you care about just changing an attribute, look it up, go do it. And then if you want to render something more complicated, closure templates also compile to JavaScript. And so what you can do is you can actually say, okay, this part of the DOM, I want to just blow it away and replace it with something else. Right. And right. then that something else doesn't need to be hydrated because right. you have JS action. Right, right. This, this is sort of where I, where I was kind of getting at, right? Because if you do granular enough destruction, then you don't actually need to hydrate. But, you know, component level granular might be acceptable for some things. Um, I, I was kind of critical of Quick at first when he first introduced it, because I think it was actually closer to Wiz originally, because I was like, I was like, I don't know if I'm, if, if I, if I, if I'm, I, I get you don't hydrate, but I'm not sure if I fully buy into this resumable thing when you just, you know, blow away the components and then like VDOM diff them or whatever. But even that is still more granular in the end on the update side than say blowing it away. But yes, I, I'm, Wiz's concern was primarily how fast can we load this in terms of like making sure we don't load extra stuff, can load just what we need when we need it. And like, Honestly, in the scale of things, that's way bigger of a problem than, than you know, as you said, if you have something really interactive, then you will bring in something that can handle doing something yeah. very interactive. So, yeah. And so, like, around the time when I joined the Wiz team, we had started working on that, right? And I think that would be a really interesting thing to get into as well at some point. Okay. Uh, we started working on something that would actually hydrate. And, and we called it progressive hydration. So this is like circa 2016-ish, 2017. And like the idea there was that instead of hydrating event handlers, we hydrate state. So hydration is still not attaching event handlers because JS action is taking care right. of that, right? Um, but to make uh, declarative UI updates possible, the hydration process will like leave some data structures and different DOM nodes. And then if you ever want to change something, instead of going and looking up something using JS name and changing it, you just change something in that data. And then the framework will come and like diff the HTML uh, and then just apply the new data. Sorry, what you're describing me to me, I, I get it's different. Uh, let me see if I can find this. It, it reminds me of this silly, I know it's not the same. It just reminds me of this framework that I that I saw about five years ago where they, I mean, the, you guys don't do this because your stuff has to be, but the, what they basically did was, he's using H function, but he, he would do stuff like write stuff into his templating and then you would just have a class essentially and then you'd update the data and then it, it was like, I, I called this like reverse jQuery. I, I, it, it, was, it was basically just 
like a, a bunch of declarative labels. Um, and then you could basically, if you updated the data, it would know where to replace the specific stuff. Pinpoint. So we didn't have the fine-grained updates the first time. When we started trying to do this, the library that we were using is IDOM. I actually was on your, I commented on your stream <laughs> sometime last year. Oh, so yeah, so you guys did something almost, oh, uh, sorry, yeah, incremental, yeah, DOM. On, on incremental GitHub, DOM. Incremental DOM on GitHub, yeah. Right, right. Incremental DOM for yep, is, that's one. some people call it a VDOM library. It's technically a single-pass VDOM library, right? Like, it, 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 it's, it's basically... Like I, I'm still confused with the difference between something like this and say like dirty checking, um, because uh, where there's there used to be really great diagrams. It was like incremental DOM versus VDOM. Um, one of them diff like in, when you have React, it diffs the previous version of the VDOM with the next version of the VDOM, mm -hmm. and then uh, figures out what the difference is, and then patches it. And my understanding mm -hmm. is that incremental DOM pa uh, patched the the virtual representation with the real DOM. There's instead of having an extra intermediary. Um, yeah, I don't will actually go through the DOM nodes themselves, and if the tag name is the same, it will try to then start patching, like change, updating the attributes. Yeah. And and you can control that behavior using like keys, just like you could like if you have a repeated like if you have a repeated list, you could control it with keys in React. Um, so it's just it, the difference is that you you don't you don't have a separate data structure, but then in practice, because like the DOM isn't that fast, you end up having a lot of the you, you end up like mirroring the attributes on uh, on the DOM itself or on the on the node itself. Yeah, sorry. This was the article I was looking for, where they compared React Virtual DOM, Ember's Glimmer, and mm. Incremental DOM. I'm just going to share this in case I didn't realize Auth Zero published it. This is probably marketing crap, but I'm just going to put this in here in case people are interested. I don't know how terribly important it is. The key part of this, though, of having Incremental DOM for you meant is you could basically set stuff up with the declaratively and not yes. like from your perspective. Okay, I was in your HTMLing before. Now yeah. I'm doing a much more efficient thing with a diff. Yeah. And and more importantly, sometimes it really helps, like you preserve focus because every time you inert HTML, you're blowing everything. Away. Yeah, yeah. This this and is this is great. yeah. This is what I actually we found when we were doing our like uh, route level stuff when we we're doing those page partials, like we we're doing like a React server component type thing, the very first version. And I guess it's also what Astro does. Um, it, it just <laughs> we just blow stuff away, right? And yeah. it's like, yeah, if you can preserve. Um, you know, I mean, you can technically like do hack around it, but if, yeah, diffing means it just should just work for the most yeah. part. And I guess with something like this, if you focus and lists can still be tricky, but I guess you, you can key them. So yeah. yeah. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. You can key them. You can key them. So that way, uh, you don't, you just reorder them. You know, you don't have to like blow it away. And, um, so this was. This was good. It, it was it actually solved one of the biggest DevX issues with Wiz, right? The DevX issue being, I don't want to use a JS name and query something, and then you know. Oh, okay, yeah, because people have asked this, and I've been kind of ignoring them until you're ready to talk about this. But mm -hmm. basically, until we got to this, these kind of like declarative diffing template type things, for the most part, people were going in and adding labels basically and doing imperative dom updates on the stuff i mean you, you people might be cringing a bit in horror even when they're thinking 2016 time period but if you if you remember that post uh that i shared on the stream a couple years ago someone was doing a review of uh amazon.com and the people were there was like we couldn't use react it just was too slow um we tried to bring it in it was too slow for server rendering it's too slow for hydration basically we, we just could not use react um, and this surprised me, this is the person said that, and this was like around 2020 time period. Mm -hmm. Um, and they said, yeah, so we were still using jQuery, um, at Amazon, uh, like on like amazon.com and, you know, people are like in disbelief around this, but I mean, people who've been working on these big sites that care about page speed load have known this for over a decade. Like they've known this for a very long time that the, like that the base table stakes were. So, um, it's not it's not an option you don't just get to be like okay um yeah we'll you know the developers like this so we're going to use that no it's like you need to at minimum be able to hit these performance targets and we'll try and make your stay a little bit more pleasant 
Um, yeah. Um, and uh, and the thing with imperative DOM updates is that it's really fast, right? Because you're handwriting what you want to do, right? right? It's, it's, it's column number one, vanilla JS, yeah, in, exactly. in, in most benchmarks. Um, and so it's hard to be that. And when the and when you're trying to look at like production numbers and like, you know, oh, how often are people interacting with this component that I really care about, like opening an email or something, and, and that number is like trending down, you're like, no, I don't, I don't it's fine. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep doing this. Um, and so that's kind of what happened, right? Like we introduced this incremental DOM based story and it was actually really good. We got excellent feedback about it, right? Because as you can see, it's actually like, helping developers significantly, right? However, when some of the larger applications tried to migrate to it, they started noticing performance issues. Right, yeah. And um, and some of it was because just migrations of these scales are really hard and like, you know, you have to, uh, you, you, you have to be very careful about how you set them up. Uh, but there were like benchmarks that were telling us that that IDOM is actually slower than just inner you know, HTMLing a bunch of stuff. Um, because we're not even looking at like update performance. We're we're even initial render performance is is not that great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's slower compared to like, you know, just inner you know, HTMLing stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yes. And 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 inner you know, HTMLing stuff was actually an option for us. Because we didn't need to manually walk the DOM to attach event listeners. You just do JS action something and like, hey, my inner HTML is interactive. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, exactly. It's just, yeah. So inner HTML has a lot of mileage when you don't hydrate and you can resume. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. just, hmm. yeah, no, that's interesting. Yeah, because like, yeah, the fastest way to create the elements. I mean, it's the reason why all the frameworks like clone templates now, right? Is is you just you just blast, you just parse it, put it in there. You know, you don't want to, you know, in bulk. That's even faster than going through and like creating each element individually and mm -hmm. attaching them and doing all that. So it's like makes a lot of sense, right? Especially as I said, if you're not sitting there like playing a video game, and as I said, you you you're not you're not expecting Wiz to like you'll load something for that video game. You're not gonna like. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Okay. No, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so that's kind of, so we're, we're caught up to like 2016. We're kind of going into 2018, 2019 now. Right. Um, because historically, and you said around the time that you, that documents proposed, you guys basically concluded that Angular and Wiz were kind of in two completely separate worlds, so to speak. Yeah. Like, yeah. And that's have been interesting too, because I, I mean, not the, throw any shade at Angular, but I mean, there's probably temptation that like you get to this really interactive part of the page and you're like, we should load Angular here to do this interactive part of the page. And that probably would be fine in a lot of cases. Maybe it comes in lazily, who cares? But Angular was also not a very small framework. Like you, you, like, you were pulling in quite a bit to even do that. So yeah. I, I, could, I could picture there being tension there between like these performance guys that are like, yeah, we shave, you know, 100 milliseconds, whatever, you know, you know, and then the, people, the developers and other people being like, you know, why can't we ha have nice things? Um, so, I don't know. Uh, yeah, wh wh where does it go from there? Um, so, it becomes clear increasingly that, like, you know, Wiz alone is not enough, and there are many different types of applications, and does Angular is and also the, by this time 2019 i think there are like i i don't know but there's definitely hundreds if not over a thousand angular applications as well and you know people are happy productive using it and so the two teams trying to you know organizationally they move in together and they're like okay we're gonna you know we're gonna learn from each other and we're gonna work together uh, um, sarah drasner joined google about that time uh, right. No, this was the first. This was like nine, 2019, right? Like, so okay, so like, she joined in like 2019 is five years ago. Yeah. Oh, crap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Sorry, yeah. I, I'm like, my time's getting all... She joined, what, 2021? Uh, Possibly, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I don't know, yeah. We'll but okay, so you, you guys are at least under the same org at this point, okay. Yeah, we're at least in the same org, and we're like... And, and one of the first 
challenges is like, oh, the build systems are all different. And like, you know, we're trying to figure out how to use like, you know, Basil and, and stuff. And, and that's, that's happening. Uh, uh, that's but then happening. On... Sorry, I, I've, heard, I've only heard of Basil because of Angular and I have no clue. It's funny because when Misco started quick, he was really um, stoked about bringing Basil over. And I have heard his team uh, got him off that very quickly. Um, anyway. Well, that's not what this stream is about. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. We, we, I, I love, I love the version of Basil we use. It's actually great. Uh, but I can understand that. Okay. It's not yeah. easy. Yeah. Um, you need you need a certain level of scale for that to start like really making sense. Right. Um, otherwise, it's like microservices, right? Like you have a, <laughs> you have a hundred users and two hundred microservices. Of course, you're gonna have a bad time. Um, so right. yeah. Um, so yeah, so so we, we, we the, the team start trying to converge, trying to change ideas, but then things are like really kind of very far away from each other, and we're we're kind of you know trying to make things better. Where each one's executing, Angular's executing on Ivy, right, and yeah. this is executing on IDOM. Um, Ivy and IDOM are are you know kind of happening at the same time. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, and then. YouTube is kind of, you know, on Polymer and Polymer, everyone's yeah. looking at YouTube and going like, hey, yeah, what should happen? And like, you know, there was a talk in NGCon recently about it. Um, so, you know, you should you should check out that keynote because like YouTube was actually like, you know, on stage and they were talking about uh, their experience and so on. Um, and, and this kind of need emerges of, you know, um, can we can we do even better than IDOM, right? Like what if what if somebody is like, can we sorry sorry can we do even better than closure templates because closure templates like like someone on chat mentioned right like the big issue is like java like you, you're trying to also render in java servers and so that's putting like severe restrictions on what you can write in your template right yeah. because anything you write there has to work in java and javascript um and so uh if someone's not server side rendering and if you go to youtube.com you can tell right like what you see is the form and the ghost cards uh everything else yeah Bring, yeah, bring it up. Yeah, let's let's bring it up. Because I, I, I'm not going to lie. I don't know how much I want to entertain this person. But um, there, I don't know if you... You already went back and forth with him on YouTube. But the second I said I was having you on the stream, he was, like, making a big thing about YouTube's performance and, and whatnot. And I was like, uh, let's let's just... <laughs> Let's just. I'll see if we get there. But let's let's look at yeah. let's look at. I, I I don't mind having like a good faith discussion. I I just I I I initially thought the person was trolling, but then the, you know they're making some good points, and so oh sorry, did the that happen too fast? <laughs> um, maybe like shift refresh. Okay. So what what, what do I want? I wanted to, to, want to kind of show you the ghost cards. Um, really, oh, like you want to yeah, see? Yeah. Oh, look at that. That's that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so it's it's client side rendered. You can you can see that right. Okay, yeah, there's like two levels. Ghost, ghost, ghost. Or no, a yeah. ghost then placeholder while the images load in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. Um, and so reasonably, right? Like why why deal with closure templates if you're not actually benefiting from them? Where one of the core foundational benefits is you can like, you know, render in our, you know, Java servers. Um, so Wiz has started developing if, Finally, uh, a templating language for Wiz. Because uh, so far, we had been using Clojure templates, and Clojure templates actually kind of came into existence independent of Wiz. Like earlier this stream, you were asking me, right? Like, what is Wiz, right? Like, because I kept, spent time talking about like the, the, the event dispatch and everything. And like, you know, you were like, okay, but how do you render? Like, Wiz will work with any rendering system. Uh, and so we we're like, okay, what if Wiz had its own rendering system? And and that's that's what we start working on. Yeah. So I was trying to see if I like I, I've always looked at YouTube's and everyone's always seen the 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 web components. Like it's very synonymous that people think mm -hmm. about. Because mm -hmm. I remember on YouTube it was like how many different frame. This is when it started clicking with like just how many different frameworks at Google, right? Because there, there's obviously Angular. I didn't know about Wiz, but I could tell that like, Google search was not Angular and not whatever YouTube uses. And you know, which is Polymer, which is but mm -hmm. new as a web component framework. Um, I guess a lot of efforts been now to kind of bring them all together. Um, but yeah, sorry, I was look. I was actually looking here for JS controller. And yeah, it's not, oh, there's no dash in between, and there isn't any yet. No. Yeah. Because okay. again, like I said, right? If you're not actually server side rendering, 
And if you're not using, you know, if you don't want to use inner HTML on the client, you, you could just hydrate as you render. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No I code mean, splitting. Yeah. So this, so YouTube, it does like the approach of rendering the shell, and then basically client renders it mm -hmm. after the fact. Interesting. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, like the first thing goes to me is, oh, you could like stream it in or whatever. But yeah, I guess who cares. Yeah, okay. I mean, that that is exactly what you should think about, right? Like, what does YouTube care about and what does search care about? Search cares about actually showing you the results and getting you off of search, right? Ideally, that's a happy user. I yeah. searched for something, I found it, yay, I'm done. And YouTube cares about the video, right? Like, that's right. why you come to YouTube. Uh, honestly, all the rendering is getting in the way. <laughs> if YouTube could just be like a television, a magic television that could just like start showing you the exact video you wanted as soon as you got to it, like, that would be the perfect right right thing. <laughs> okay so okay so what you're saying is i'm not going to find js controller here um uh yeah because I, I mean i saw the presentation and it, it was more about uh a, a collaboration i because i there's there was something that was released on whiz related on youtube right because youtube yes. started as polymer as you said yes um but then yeah. they, they wanted to change what they were using or mm -hmm. so uh polymer is like uh heavily deprecated obviously right like right i guess it's lit, lit still yeah, yeah 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 you use lit and um youtube um runs on many many different devices right like like was shared in the ng comp talk right like there's the mobile website and there is also youtube on televisions um and these different kind of extremely wide variety of devices don't all support web components like some of them right. even today do not and thus, you would have to ship inexpensive polyfill, and that certainly wasn't helping lit, right? Um, yeah, yeah, I know. It's funny, though. Like, it, it's because, I mean, things have gone better over time. I can only imagine what this was like 10 years ago when they made the choice to go to Polymer. That's that's interesting. That's, that's, that's brave. Um, yeah. Anyway. And, um, and so... We're like, okay, let's try to figure this out. Can we somehow have a web, like, so, so we actually spent a couple of years exploring tag template literals uh, as the authoring. So, so now Wiz is looking for an authoring format, right? We're like, okay, fine. We, we cannot do closure templates because uh, we have, you know, a lot of developers who just want to author something and like that, that's, that's you know, web, web friendly. And so we spent a couple of years looking at tag template literals. Um, and then we find TSX. Um, and TSX ended up checking uh, a lot of boxes that that we were looking for, like developer experience wise. Interesting. I, I, I mean, I'd love to know why, because it's so funny that like almost JSX or TSX has kind of recently become default, like new frameworks, like, yeah, we use TSX. Yeah. But there was a time period where it was only React or React clones. And mm -hmm. then like, I, I fell on to TSX because I was really, really lazy um, on that part. I, I like legitimately did not care about inventing a new syntax. Everyone seems so obsessed. I'm like, I want, I want things to mechanically work. How did you guys, like, what, what, what were some deciding factors for you guys? If I were to severely oversimplify it, I, I would agree with you, right? Like, I mean, we don't want to invent new syntax. <laughs> I mean, new syntax is how we got closure templates. Uh, we just invented all new syntax. And so what if we just kind of went close, you know, I don't know, I guess, what if this were a library, not a framework? You just wrote TypeScript and it worked. Right. Um, and so we got, there's a lot more. I'm oversimplifying it. And I, I don't think a lot of it is actually that relevant um, for reasons, right? We, we kind of got there, right? And, okay. and so that was the main thing. So we said, okay, we'll have a first class templating system. And I think, I guess, the most innovative thing is if you write that TSX, you can actually render in Java servers um, through some compilation steps. And so that's kind of where we are now. Because you, um, so you got like, because the expressions, you know, the inside the JSX are JavaScript. So yeah. you guys definitely have a like JavaScript to Java expression thing, right? Like, you effectively, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so. So that's kind of where we are. And um, this, when you're rendering the TSX only on the client side, it actually lets you attach event handlers like just synchronously. 
like it lets you finally wiz will just let you do that and and that is just to make sure that like you know immigration from polymer to wiz is possible right otherwise it's just not possible because your event handlers are running synchronously and like participating in like the browser native bubbling is suddenly like all delegated and like you know not firing in the same order anymore that's not that's not going to work in migration I can only imagine trying to migrate apps of this at this size. See, I, I was really lucky when I joined the eBay team. They had just finished the giant Marco uh, three to four migration, so I came in on like Greenfield new new development. I missed. I when you, when you have you know hundreds or thousands of apps depending on your stuff, and you're just like making something that seems like a very small change. You know, will make things better, and it's like nope, everything just works now in a way that's like slightly different, even if it makes more sense. We depended on these things firing. And you're like, why would you ever depend on the... Never mind. Like, Yeah, what's that thing that they say, right? Like if you have enough users, like essentially every aspect of your system is now just your API. Like I forget. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so we're, we're kind of allowing synchronous event handlers, except we're like designing syntax that somehow will eventually, you know, also work when you're server side rendering. And so that's kind of where Viz is right now. We're, we're trying to uh, reconcile the, 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 the first and the second largest websites in the world and giving them the same programming model. Right. Uh, and that's, yeah, interesting. <laughs> that's, that's, that's very cool. But I mean, you say that's where Wiz is today, but I mean, I guess then the natural question is, there's because a couple things we we haven't talked about um, terms wise, and then we'll tie it in to you know where things are heading. First thing is, um, let's. I'm just going to try throwing this term at you, and you can explain it the best. Uh, resumability. I'm just going to use this term. Quick has popularized it, though he, he, uh, Mishko does give all the credit to Wiz when he ever speaks about it. Um, what, how would you describe resumability? Um, and, you know, I know you already described how Wiz works, but like, yeah. what, what what does that term mean to you? Like, did you guys use a term like this before? Or are we giving the, or does he, or does Misco get coining rights here, so to speak? Um, he does, he has coined, to the best of my knowledge, uh, he coined the term resumability. And I'm actually glad because that gives us a vocabulary to talk about Wiz. Because um, before that, like, trying to explain, like we would explain it as deferred event handlers and then, you know, start talking about JS action and JS controller and like, you know, it's not making any sense. And but resumability captures an important piece that we haven't spoken about yet, which I think is kind of a very like irritating thing, but then a very important thing. And that's data. When you server side render, you yeah. have all your template props, right? That are flowing down, deciding what HTML is getting rendered. Um, the event handlers, especially when you do like single file authoring, they want to close over those same props and use them. Yeah. So when you server side render, you actually need to capture the state of the system. And and I think Quick calls it like closure extraction. Yeah. But then like even that's not getting to the heart of it, which is that you somehow need to serialize that data. And then you've spent a lot of time talking about like the double data problem and so yeah. on, right? Um, and and Resumability, I think, captures that nuance also very well. It's not just about like hydrating event listeners. It's actually also about making sure once hydrated, those event listeners have the data that they need. Right, right, yeah. I, I, I've tried to show this on stream before. Um, let's see, refresh. But like the, the first closure thing is, it's, it, peop, I mean, it's really obvious when you inline the events, but it's, you know, I'm just put it in here. People picture themselves just like having these references to these global event handlers. But the question is like, how do you get set count in, like how do you get the count inside these things if you never ran the component in the first place? Or like this could come from props or something. Like there's a whole tree of data running through your app. Mm -hmm. And then you have these basically, I mean, whether it's the component or the event handler as these entry points, you, you suddenly have this problem where the, the data is coming from outside that mm -hmm. scope, right? Um, I'm so, trying to make it more visual. I don't know yeah. if that, that succeeds, but so if you want to maybe see this in code, um, let me see. Are you? Can you pull up Google Photos or something? Um, uh, or if you don't maybe. want to do photos, uh, try Google Finance. Finance? Yeah. I've never. 
I on think, here. I think this one should. Okay, so now like in the HTML, look for a C dash wiz tag. I hope I find it. Oh, good. Okay, there cool. GS right. Render. And so, um, yeah, just expand that a little bit more. Uh, I, th I, I think it's cutting out. Uh, I can't see. I'm, I'm looking for some attributes and they're missing. Let's see if I can. Okay, this. cool. Uh, so this one is a little trivial, but um, if you if you actually click on this, if you so, so there are two things that I want to point out here. The first one is the JS data attribute, which says deferred C14. Yeah. And the other one is the data dash p attribute. Okay. Um, in which case, in, in this case, the data p is empty because there happen to be no params. But what we kind of realized was that there are two types of data that a component, that an event handler and a component might want access to. The first is the data that was available like just synchronously. Yeah. So that means is your request came in, it was like, you know, uh, slash about question mark something yeah right? so query parameters, so query parameters route, route, route yeah based information yeah and then like some maybe uh eagerly fetched data like you you, right. you don't want to depend on backends uh you, you don't want to like block on a, on a on a on a call to an api backend before you start rendering right because because your goal should be to like start rendering as soon as possible and so you can start streaming the page back I had to blow it up. Some people were yeah. complaining about the size. I, I usually I'm blown blown up, but not uh, not in in this screen apparently. Um, yeah, I, I mean I'm staring at like a tiny Chromebook here, <laughs> but um, but yeah. Um, so so data data p represents all of that data. That the data that is just synchronously like and or immediately available right. because you either just derived it trivially from the incoming request. Or you just paid, you know, for a blocking call to some backend, and now now that response is available to you. Right. JS data. The reason it's deferred is is because it's actually um, you you don't want to block on that, but you know that 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 is a that is a, a result of a backend call. Okay. Um, and so you distinguish between these two types of data, and they get serialized in two different ways. And depending on and then in the body of your component right anytime you just depend on like so we call them params and data so in the body of the component if you depend on params you're not going to block streaming it's just going to keep working right but as soon as you depend on data of course you cannot render till the till the that till that api call finishes okay and and so at that point rendering will like stop and like you know wait for that to finish and then resume right right so you guys yeah. get like it's a async fragment kind of things like suspense or whatever. This is the right. data read side of it. Right. Okay. And and so this CVIS boundary is a, a, a kind of um, a hyd like a hydration boundary. So what yeah. that means is like all of the data is available here. And so from this point down, like you can just infer the data. Um, right. Okay. This is like where like all your params are serialized. So it's a different kind of component that has this like serialization overhead. And so that's right. how you know. And then from here, like you know, some logic infers like oh, what's actually required by the event listener. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No. I, hopefully, it's making sense to people uh, in in the the audience here. But um, very roughly speaking, this is kind of like a suspense boundary, like kind mm -hmm. of um, where it's the, basically things will pause and pick up from this point um, if there's some async data that it needs inside of it it's actually a little bit more like a serialization boundary like maybe a quick oh more container. like an island yeah uh, possibly yeah yeah you could call it an island you can think of it as an island yeah 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 but like you need this you, you need to serialize your data periodically because otherwise your event listeners don't know and so this is the, like different like quick has a different strategy and it, i think the whole strategy is completely different in quick one and quick two uh, yeah. about how this gets serialized uh and i think if you like yeah, I'm, I'm sure any server-side rendering solution has some serialization system like this. Right. Yeah. No. Yeah. We, exactly. We. Yeah. In our case, um, we we have a kind of blob that keeps on streaming the data at the bottom as it as it comes in, and then as it hydrates, it because we have 
basically promises it almost runs the same way like it does when it like when it does the initial client renders if it reads from an async promise that hasn't resolved it's like okay i'm hydrating and i haven't resolved i'm going to assume that i'm suspending and i'm going to wait until that boundary is good to go right right so yeah so okay, so we were talking about resumability and like who coined the term i i, I said mishko did and and we didn't we weren't we weren't thinking of it in terms of like resumability, but I think it's I, I like it because it includes this data aspect, which is you know kind of uh, interesting and and it doesn't get discussed as often. Yeah, the, and the data aspect is actually really interesting to me because I mean maybe you know have an answer to a question that I've been trying to figure out here because I've been looking at a lot of different models. I've been looking at server components. I've been looking obviously at Quick's resumability and all, and you know. Obviously, I've been optimizing just the typical like single page app cases, uh, you know, type stuff that I do. I've been doing with Solid, and I, I guess it's interesting to me is like data. Some data could just stay on the server conceptually because you know you never need the update on the client. But once you get to a point where there's stuff that does get updated on the client. Um, like where there has to be some level of diffing or hydration, you end up having to serialize some amount of, of data. Um, like we know that if you e eagerly load the code but don't execute it, it doesn't cost you that much, right? Um, I mean, I guess the browser parsing it could be expensive, but if you can do it in such a way that, you know, you can render the page and you don't, person doesn't interact with it in that first you know few hundred milliseconds the fact that that code is you know kind of coming in mm -hmm. you know is fine it doesn't really impact your page score or your core web vitals or anything because it's kind of just happening in the background and the page is there it's not going to run any javascript until you actually do anything so you're not blocking you know very much there um but I, i'm i'm kind of wondering if the same is true about data right because like it seems to be like at a certain point a trade-off because you're actually sending uh you know a bunch of data to the page this is I, I was very interested in islands and server components for a long time because i was thinking oh theoretically although not all implementations handle this is you could kind of solve that double data problem with like islands do, do server components could reacts do not but they could theoretically say like i only need to ship it in one form either as the rendered html or as the data that i that i need um you know, uh, in to show that after the fact for server only stuff, for things that aren't interactive, you can basically say you don't need to send it twice. I, I, sorry, where I'm going with this is mm -hmm. um, if you don't need to hydrate, mm -hmm. like, does that change the math considerably? Like, does, like, let's pretend like you, like, if the page size gets larger and it's just because you're tagging on a bunch of data that you don't need immediately, do you know, like, does that affect? Uh, page scores or like I, it's one of those things I've been yeah. trying to figure out. So if you try to make this decision at like the framework level um, and you just say that you're just going to serialize all the data right like everything that's going into the templates I'm going to serialize it you may end up serializing things that you're not required so like if we take this like brute force extreme right like just yeah. raw whiz you're not using this like CVS stuff or anything um, technically, all that you're doing is you're you're capturing the event, you're dispatching the event, you're waking up the event listener, and at that point, right? Maybe the author of the event listener could decide uh, what data they actually care about, and then place them as like data dash attributes, right? And so then you say that the framework's like really not not involved in this. Like you, as the author of your component, know exactly what data you depend on, and you can like serialize it on the page, right? And so then that's like super optimal because like you're now letting that decision be made by those who actually need the data. So if they're careful, they just won't serialize the data that they don't need. Right. Right. Which I, I, I guess. Like, yeah. What I was trying to get to is what about the data they don't need yet? I guess is is, is the more because we talk yeah. about codes bundle splitting. So, but what about yeah, so data I, splitting? Yeah, I, I get, I get, it, I get it. So, like for example, if you have a control flow component and you like update a signal, and that's going to send you down a different path, right? And and now just in that different path, you closed over a different set of props, and so like those props are available during initial render, and then later at some point you you toggle the control flow, and and now you need the props that you didn't need initially, and and so you need, end up speculatively needing to serialize all the props 
because you don't know if you will need it later, right? Sure. Um, that's that's like an example, and like that is, and and that is why you just kind of conclude. I am just going to serialize all the props, like whatever. I don't know what you might need later, um, but yeah, there is no like data splitting thing here that I'm aware of uh, because you would have to essentially analyze like all the control flow components. Cause I think that the, the, the use case is control flow, right? Like that's where the, you- Yeah, I mean, the other place you hit this weirdness isn't just props, but I mean, it, it, I guess one of the things that I was always thinking would be really difficult or tricky with uh, Angular getting into resumability is like dependency injection or context APIs. These are places where you have, I, sorry, I'm sending you right the deep end here, but these are places where you have shared data, um, you know, zones that, you know, aren't so local. You you had to say zone, didn't you? <laughs> no, no, I don't mean like zone JS, obviously, but yeah. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Context is tough. Uh, when you're trying to make a resumable framework and you do like hierarchical DI or context, yeah, uh, it immediately like you end up uh, having to wonder like wh how do you how do you handle this? Yeah. Um, because like you want to actually only resume the event listener, but then as soon as your event listener is injecting context, you now have to go up and like somehow like find a way to like hydrate a sliver that gives you the context. Um, I don't actually. I just yeah don't don't have a yeah props drilling is not fun. I guess so. Um, yeah, I don't have a great answer here. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I, the reason. I, I this was just piquing my curiosity because I've been staring at these problems for like the last yeah. little while, and I've, I've I keep on looking at them and circling around it, and I'm like, yeah. you know, I'm just gonna put Jan on the spot a little bit when he's here but in terms of that. Basically, a lot of the thing time with Wiz, because the goal has been very much like let's make efficient websites or whatever. It's just like you, these are probably problems you're like now starting to hit more than historically because historically you're just like. Don't do that. Just, just make the thing fast. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, kind of. Um, that, that 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 does capture the sentiment. Now, now we're starting to because when you're doing client-only rendering, like you know, context is a super reasonable API to ask right. for. Of course, it should exist. It totally makes sense. Uh, but then, how do you decide when to serialize it on a server? Do you just keep serializing it every point it is used? Isn't that going to result in like you know over serialization? Uh, probably. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's not a. The, the, there isn't a very obvious answer here that kind of comes to mind. Yeah, the, as I said, this was just guilty on my part because I've been. Th this is exactly where my thinking is. I've been. I've been going very deep on the uh, island server component thing, and I'm. I'm in a new phase where I'm very interested in. Uh, you know, looking at uh, taking a second look at resumability. I looked at a lot when this go initially, um, but I, I. I have an interest here because mm -hmm. there's one thing that we've been kind of hinting around or talking about here is you were using events uh, systems or kind of imperative APIs uh, in terms of, you know, waking these things up, figuring out what triggers this, figuring out what depends on what. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess something that has, you know, changed for a lot of frameworks a little bit more recently is the realization that we could create a DX where the developer is telling you how all the data is linked in all the data dependencies and they actually seem to like it. And mm -hmm. I'm, t I'm talking about signals. Um, so, and reactivity. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, is it a good time? Like, should we talk a bit about this? Cause I think people are kind of yeah. interested in how, how, like we've talked down data and templating and it seems you can kind of see why this is attractive and start seeing this picture of, you know, maybe how Angular and Wiz work together. But I, I feel like we're not getting to the full story until we actually talk about signals. Yeah, yeah, we, we have to. I, I was avoiding it a little bit because you said at the start that, you know, it's not about signals. And um, but yeah, we can that is certainly get us right right now. Right. Like it's a big, yeah. big missing piece. Um, I don't know if this is a uh, can we do like a quick two minute break yeah, <laughs> or, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah sure sure yeah, sure yeah, we, I, I catch up you need a moment yeah it's all good yeah just i i, I go i go I'm hard like, yeah i need to like steal myself for the next hour discussion about signals yeah yeah yeah, yeah. no I, I don't know if it'll be that long but maybe we will we'll, yeah. it's, it's, it's all good yeah take it take a moment all right i'll uh, be, right, be right back okay cool hey jana will be back don't don't worry i'm gonna we can st let me see if i can catch up with chat here how, how are you all doing I, 
I hear... No, not the right one. I hear Ryan and Seagull, so I hit the like button. <laughs> the problem is the chat scrolls and I was trying to highlight the... Anyways. Um... Yeah, I'm trying to catch up here on chat. Uh, let's see, Greg had a good question. Is the suspense boundary basically the component more or less fine grained? I think at least what I picked up from Wiz so far and is that almost everything is kind of their unit, you know, like they're almost like they define these things almost. I don't know even to call them components. I don't think I'm not sure if they had the same level of components as us. They clearly have classes, but like, I don't know if it's like the way we think about components. Cause you, they, he already introduced like multiple concepts, right? Um, controller, a, um, action model, um, whatever this boundary is. My, my, it, it kind of reminds me, I don't know if anyone developed an Ember in the like, 2000, like pre, probably not. I'm probably like the only person here who developed an Ember in that old phase. But like, even Angular One was a bit like this. Like before, everyone started streamlining, and it, it was like MVC plus plus, where you just kept on adding these new classes for different types of things and wired them together. I swear, like old Ember had like eight different types of classes that you would use. Like you had a controller, you had a container, you had a route, you had a whatever, and. Yeah, it's kind of, I feel like it's a little bit different than the concept of component that we have today, you know, like the thanks to React concept of component. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Amazing to hear what they're doing at the scale and the attempts to merge. Lit. I, I don't know if I don't know if lit's on the merging block. I, that's a that's an interesting question. Like, is lit? I, I mean, I don't I don't. I feel like we probably can't talk about it unless it's official. So it's, but I, I I know we know Angular and Wizard are part of the same organization. I don't know if lit is still in a different zone, so to speak. You you asking me? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> um. Uh, I mean, lit, lit, I think the lit framework is about uh, being really close to web components and like using the platform as much as possible, right? And like I mentioned earlier, like um, when, when you don't control the platform because you need to reach users on every possible device, you, you cannot make as many assumptions. Um, and so I think to really stay true to what lit needs to be, which is like really thin layer. Like here's the only thing that's missing in the platform. Otherwise you should just use a platform as much as possible. Um, it makes it a different kind of framework, I feel. Um, and also like to stay really true to like no build step, right? Um, it, it, it's, uh, th those are a different set of kind of, you know, uh, you're, you're going after a different kind of market space there. Um, and, and it makes sense for it to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, we're, we're, with our Java servers and everything, like we're like too complicated for that and probably just end up complicating lit itself, <laughs> which is which is not great for anybody. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. But thanks for thanks for clarifying that a bit. Yeah. Um, all right, finally arriving at the point. <laughs> People want to hear more about Signal. It's fine. I just, I it's funny. Uh, I can remember when we first met, You we, we just talked about Wiz and resumability and that was, Ooh, I don't know. A while ago, was it two years ago? Almost a year and a half. It no, was a while actually, ago. it was like a year. <laughs> Less than was it years. only a year? Because yeah. la Last right. summer, we we was not the first time, but we met up and we started talking the signals thing. So I guess yeah, you're right. I, it, was, it was about I, a year I, ago. I, yeah, yeah, yeah that was a uh, yeah. It feels like it's been longer. So much has happened in the in the signal process. So I'd already been talking to the Angular guys about signals before we before we talked. I yeah. see. Okay. Yeah, and that puts it back in the timeline. But some point during the summer, I forget it was in July or August or some point, um, um, myself, Jad, and Alex, Pavel from Angular, um, we all sat in a room and we just talked about what we were working on and talking about uh, signals, basically. And it was kind of clear because, uh, yeah, it was a little bit later on in the summer because Milo had already published his... Uh, um, reactively in papers. I guess the previous year, but no, that he, was the previous year. Yeah, that was twenty twenty one. Oh, sorry, right. twenty twenty two. And right. yeah, 
Right. Uh, so he he had to stop, and we were all looking at the signals implementations, and we we were all like, you know, I it was it was actually Milo coming back from bu- Bubble. Actually, he worked his summer job for a company that used Solid, but also had their own reactivity system, and he wanted to kind of merge it and yeah. kind of get an idea of like what this unified base was. And at the exact same time, Angular and Wiz team had been talking about how they could share it. So we all like sat in the room and we're like, yeah, so we basically agree on everything. Okay, we're good. Um, <laughs> Which was like actually one of the first moments that I, um, I really I was like thought that it was like wow was, like could we all share the same sort of um, you know implementation piece I wasn't sure I was kind of like going off a deep end but we were actually talking about a lot of similar problems we're talking about resumability I, it was a great um, great day I got to go down to the Google um, campus and you know hang out so lots of fun and very kind of productive idea thinking kind of situation and it was it made a lot of sense that you know uh dominic uh svelte had separately been talking with uh daniel um for a while in bloomberg and like this because they, they they had their thing going and they they were kind of pushing harder on the standard side so um I feel like a large part of like when this happened was when those two groups met and then it was like, okay, signals proposal time. And then obviously pulled in, uh, you know, uh, people from Ember community who were actually very vocal on, on, on the proposal. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, several other f- uh, frameworks we uh, we did we did have showings from uh, view a bit at the beginning and then we got the guys from preact a little bit later on um, to to bring out the proposal but I, I'm not so much talking about the proposal today I just wanted to kind of get an idea that it became kind of very clear even in those initial conversations before the signals proposal came out that there was some kind of common shared ground here um, yeah. yeah so this is me saying a bunch. Yeah. Uh, your experience then, uh, obviously going to this with with Angular and Wiz, like how 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 did the signals thing kind of come in your mm-hmm. scope of radar and like that this was a, a possibility? Yeah. So we had started working on a TSX based templating system so that like Wiz could finally actually have a templating library of its own, and um, we were initially using incremental DOM. So the system that we were building kind of looked like React with incremental DOM a little bit. And when we started trying it out, we noticed that there were performance problems with that. And the performance problems kind of come from, you know, having to manually keep track of your dependencies, you know, the the famous depth arrays. Um, And so what we, we kind of took a step back and and this is maybe the time to answer like some of those questions on Twitter. <laughs> um, we took a step back and we really looked at the important, certain really important components that were demonstrating these performance problems. And those were the ones we chose to migrate, right? And so when we say YouTube's using signals, we mean there are a few key components, like for example, the video scrubber or you know, like when you're like uh, scrolling through shorts, like where performance really matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Uh, well, I hope that the first question's kind of answered. <laughs> yeah. What actually Wiz does, yeah, everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, why, why all the claims to be amazing performance are shattered? By, yeah, well, cause all of YouTube isn't using Wiz and even if it did, uh, Wiz is not gonna guarantee performance, right? Like. Performance requires a lot, uh, especially for a large app. And so, I I really hope we get to the point where like you know, um, you know, YouTube's also like you know just perfect on like all the public performance ways to measure performance. Uh, but you know what matters is uh, you know what what is impacting the business, and and it, obviously the video matters the most. And so we're looking at components related to video first, not like some you know, random menu somewhere. Uh, and so when you start switching those to signals, you can see, or we noticed that, you know, we were getting more like smooth 60 FPS. And, you know, the, again, I, the, the ng-conf keynote talks about this uh, in more detail. Uh, and, and so that's where we started seeing that, oh, maybe signals would actually deliver on like, you know, performance by default versus performance as opt-in. 
like when you're manually tracking right. dependencies, it's you're opting into performance and it all it takes is one careless mistake somewhere and like, oops, it's slow. I, I love that part, the talk. I'm not going to lie. I was sitting there when I was rewatching the keynote and I was like, man, I, I've been trying to say this stuff for years and years and years and years. And it's like to, to watch it on a, the big stage like that was like incredible. Like it's, it's, it's almost like taking this, it's like taking this fact now. And I'm like, cause I mean, even you're right. I, when we started, at least our, my, my journey with signals and solid, it was like kind of speculative. And now it's like, actually, yes. <laughs> so like, it's, it's, it's very cool to, to kind of see this make impact um, on actual, you know, yeah. sites. And the other thing, which is maybe a lesser discussed aspect of Signals that I, I'm kind of very excited about right now and I think is promising, is that Signals is a more backwards compatible strategy compared to a VDOM approach. Like if you have an existing application that's using jQuery style stuff everywhere, right? You can incrementally introduce Signals uh, without having to like, you know, worry too much. But if you introduce VDOM, you now, at the point where you introduced VDOM, everything below it, everywhere you're doing imperative DOM updates, you have to somehow protect that, right? So that the VDOM diff doesn't blow it all away. Yeah, yeah. But with yeah. signals, you're doing fine-grained updates, and thus the stuff you need to protect is, like, limited, and it's actually a super tractable problem. Um, and... And we'd been trying to migrate our depot to IDOM for like five years at this point, right? And and so when a more backwards compatible approach kind of shows up, we want to try it out. And yeah. so that is something I'm personally like super excited about. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. We always got that comment uh, about, and it, it didn't click on me as much, but we did get that comment for a while because people were like, oh, it's easy to integrate with jQuery or whatnot. And it's just because like when you're, you're just dealing with the DOM and you can just like... Yeah, the, the way that uh, I what, you know you can what scale up or scale down or what like the, the whatever the term is it's not scale but the way signals can are at a core basis are basically just like a kind of like a synchronization system for the like, you know I don't know for any kind of side effect it makes it really interesting because you you don't actually there's no there's no like the buy in is. There is buy-in because you have to now you're now using these primitives, but on the other hand, they can do as little or as much as you want them to do. There's no single way to make signals work. Um, people have been using this type of reactivity since knockout days, even before maybe you know in other languages. Um, but you know, there, there's a whole range of stuff. I, I remember at one point having a conversation where people were like, oh, it's all so fast because it's fine grained, and I'm like, yeah, but it's also fast because I have complete control on how fine grained I want to to make it like you, 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 you basically added a dimension where now you have this knob that you can adjust it rather than just being like, I'm all in on this system. I have, I am VDOMing like, yeah. you know, like you, you can, you can be like, you can, you can put a VDOM inside a reactive effect or whatever. Like you, you I, actually, I want to see this. If you want to like bring up some code and like look at it together, uh, I, I saw a little implementation of a use signal hook. Uh, that that works in React, uh, yeah. Like less than hundred lines of code, and it uses like the, the the signals proposal. And I was like, wow, yeah, that that makes sense. The, the, that one's always interesting because it's like the to make this stuff work in React. And I've I've done this before. It's it's kind of like the, almost the opposite exercise. Where, but yes, it is kind of it, it's kind of interesting because you have to you have to have a much. The, the knob actually exists, right? Because when you use an API like you sync external store, you control yeah. the subscription. So, right. so you kind of still have the knob if you really wanted it. And you could create this entire system that just lives outside of React that decides like, oh, when are my stores going to invalidate? And right. then you can try to do optimizations. Like if I'm already invalidating something below and above, I'm just going to skip this one. Right, yeah. It, it's a little tricky in the... The once you at a certain point you hand over the keys to React, like at a certain point you're like, okay, go re-render that component, and then everything is kind of true under the hood. So, like in the past when I've created signals implementations into VDOM like React, it, you, there is the signals implementation, and then there's the place where you hook in the subscriptions. Basically, use the hook to basically do it, or use tracking. Depends on the approach. Um, but then you also have to 
memo out of all this, uh, the ch children as well to make sure that React doesn't overwork because otherwise you're just, you know, you trigger a parent and then you recreate all the children anyways. And you, it's kind of yeah. like there's, there's, there's some conflicting stuff there. Um, over, like MobX has done that has done a certain approach to reactivity that I feel like is like the stock way of doing it. And then Jotai has like a slightly different approach where the use of the atom is what does the subscription. Like one has auto tracking, one has explicit tracking, but generally they both kind of have to rely on using kind of opting out of React's hierarchical VDOM consideration. Um, so it's, yeah. It's, I know. Yeah, it's been shared in the chat. Yeah, uh, Daishi's use signal. Um, yeah, that's the one I'm talking about, yeah. Yeah, I, yeah you, I guess to be fair, you, I, although a little bit of a tangent, you were part of the group that presented the signals proposal uh, to to TC39 yesterday to when it came, and it's stage one now, if people weren't aware, mm. which is pretty cool. But yeah. bringing this back uh for a bit is yeah i i was trying to get to where we we talked about how saw signals the way improving stuff like youtube um I, i'm just curious like angular's got signals wiz has got signals how is this the key to the merger um so to speak so there was a slide that i that that i presented to tc39 and and that's actually super relevant right like when you look at a signals API, there's actually three main APIs. There's, there's state or signal, yeah. there's computed, and there's effect, right? Yeah. But um, if you notice the proposal, it actually doesn't have an effect API. Instead, it has a lower level API called Watcher. Yeah. And this was kind of what the Wiz and Angular teams kind of realized together was if we said that's where we kind of define our signals library. So like the graph building, the auto tracking, and like update propagation, all of that is shared, but then both frameworks can hook in like their execution strategy and scheduling strategy at, in a different effect API. Yeah. That gives us a starting point to actually start using the same code. And yeah. so that way we got to this point where like, if you go to the Angular repo, uh, there's this primitives directory there. And um, the code there is actually also running on YouTube. Like it's the exact same thing. Right. Uh, well, I mean, when I say on YouTube, like the parts of YouTube that have started right. trying this out again, not the entire like this thing is still up on screen and like keeps screaming at me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, yeah. I, 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 can, I can tuck it away. Yeah, it's yeah. funny. That that split actually uh, that you're talking about. Yeah, it, it, it's something that I didn't realize either because I'd spent a lot of time teaching the three basic language pieces, right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until milo released reactively that i realized otherwise because if you remember milo just didn't have effect he just like literally was like i, I made the reactive system no effects like he yeah. just straight up just skipped that part and he's like yeah if you want an effect you can just uh, you know o like override the class for the, the the tracking scope and make your own effect and schedule it yeah. he basically cared zero about effects and i was like that I, and that was for me when and he went to bubble and they proved it out. It's very similar exercise, I guess you guys did with Angular and Wiz, where it's like suddenly like, wait a second, there is a core part that we mostly all agree on, right? Right. Um, and so that's just kind of this inception, right? Like that's the that's the uh, the kickoff. But then uh, we believe there are a few more such core pieces, like more primitives that we can actually align on and actually get to where it's the same code being used and practically achieve a lot of convergence for like the code that runs the hardest, right? The most important code. And using those primitives, you could make like a whole gallery of different web frameworks with different philosophies, uh, but then aligning on like, and, and the perfect example of the philosophy of a web framework is like the authoring format. Like how do you write your templates, right? Like you mentioned earlier, you're like super lazy about it. You didn't actually care, so you just picked TSX. And it's actually, that's a very, very fair point of view. And I share that. Like it actually does not matter how you author your templates. The most interesting parts of the framework are like, what is the reactivity? What is the component model? And you know, uh, what is your take on like dependency injection, context, and stuff like that? And then you just the authoring format is just you know, it's it's your docs page. It's important, but it is your docs page. 
like you know it's just how you finally then bring this whole thing and like you know bundle it and put it in front of a developer it's funny to think that we we're getting to a point where frameworks are just a matter of like putting together these well-known primitives see I, I i like i like challenging this all the time because i'm always like like my, my it was actually kind of funny right before the signals proposal went out i was i i did that signals 2.0 stream uh which is a few weeks back and i was like yeah i'm, I'm pretty happy with this you know 1.0 thing but I, i'm already trying to find ways to to push it or break it or maybe challenge some of our assumptions on it um but i i I, I think that's the perfect thing when you go through standardization is you recognize like what the shared parts is the process that the framework authors independently to like the TC39 went through to understand that uh, Dominic was also on the same page as well from Svelte. Um, it was kind of crazy to see that amount of alignment. I, I We haven't seen that. I, I don't remember ever having that amount of alignment between frameworks. Um, yeah, I would like a wild screenshot of like the kickoff meeting. Hang on, I'm going to show you. Yeah. Um, it was just... Um, just seeing so many um, of the people in like the same room was just, uh, yeah, I, I couldn't like believe it. <sighs> Hang on. Um, like Rich was there and Mishko was there and like, um, yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna just really quickly share just one thing from my screen. Is that okay? Yeah, go for it. Put it up and I'll, I'll get you in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, just, just a picture. <laughs> this is like a, a screen grab. Uh, All right, see, it's call. Like this was like the first call we had <laughs> and like, yeah, this was, it, and everybody was there and I was just like, wow, this is perfect. Right. Like you have like, yeah, angu angular, quick, solid and swelled. Yeah, Ma, we got M M Michelle from, uh, yeah, I'm mean, on the top. What you don't see is there's like m way more people in this call. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure Michelle joined. I, I can't remember if Andrew Clark actually ever joined one of the calls. He was part of the group for a bit. But so that's actually React yeah. core team right here. Um, uh, yeah, Misco, Quick, mm -hmm. and Angular, Angular, Svelte, Evan Yu. Um, yeah, Evan couldn't you? make it because like it, yeah. it was. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> Ryan leaked his real background. <laughs> you, you're right. Uh, yeah, but this was I think October of last year. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's when we started up. It was like around September, October. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, no, it was a, uh, yeah, so. I mean, it's pretty. I, that's that, that's why I actually don't have tons to say on the specifics of the proposal. I've told you guys already on stream that I'm pretty confident that I can implement what I need to on top if I so choose to. Um, uh, because I remember we went through a few phases, and I think eventually the uh, Angular, you, the, the the watch idea that you guys originally had, it became the thing that that eventually like became the the final agreement point, a variation on that, and. Um, yeah, I mean, from the first day you guys told me that part, I was like, yeah, it's different than I was picturing, but yeah, I, I can work with that. I don't care. So I <laughs> went on to work on whatever the next thing that I wanted to work on. That's that's been the problem. I'm, I'm terrible for standards type stuff. Like I, 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 I like I look and see what I can use and then I'm like, if something doesn't fit. I'm just like, it's OK, I'll, I'll do something else. It's like, no, no, we want everyone to agree. And I'm like, no, it's it's OK. You know, I, I don't don't worry about me. I'm probably going to change my mind tomorrow and the. <laughs> To, 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 don't don't hold me to it. Um, but no, I'm I'm glad that there's enough of that commonality um, that we can kind of actually build upon. Um, I, and, I, I'm very curious to see like how we can get like some async and some notion of transactions in there. I think those are like two very big missing pieces right now. Um, yeah, within like what we have so far. Yeah, yeah, it's it's tricky because I, I while I I don't know if we can ignore like. Technically, this stuff can happen without the effect portion, but it's like, yeah, it's it's doable. I, I, I mean, I just, I mean, this is a complete aside. Just two seconds, hack MD. Oh, am I in the wrong? It's been so long. Oh, uh, it's there GitHub. Yeah, it's probably GitHub. It's fine. Um, where was I? Uh, uh, Yeah, you know, I don't need to get into this right now. Sorry, I, I actually like after after my stream last week, I, I went even 
further into what I was proposing because I was trying to figure out I've, I've been struggling. The funny thing is, you know how everyone's got this the push pull, you know, uh, mm-hmm. approach, and we we all use push pull, but mm-hmm. the lazy push pull has been become synonymous. Everyone uses you, you went that direction, right? Obviously, mm-hmm. um, Milo did it with reactively. Um, preacted and then obviously angular did and then mm-hmm. everybody went to this l- kind of lazy evaluation approach. solid was never that solid is actually mm-hmm. the maybe the only eager push pull li- library which is, is weird it, because mo- is it because you have like synchronous render effects uh but, but i mean even with the synchronicity like we could just pull at that point i just we always just scheduled them like where mm-hmm. we had like a pure phase and then effect phase and actually made stuff like concurrency a lot easier because you knew everything would run before everything else would run. You wouldn't be in the middle of effect and reading something for the first time. So it actually solved scheduling and okay. concurrent rendering and all these things automatically. And now I'm getting to a point where I'm like reviewing the stuff and going through and I'm like, man, this, I, c- I can work around it, but this is actually different. We actually had a whole bunch of stuff for async and concurrency working on in our favor. Like we, we don't have the diamond problem with async because we don't right. we trigger it not on pull, we trigger it eagerly. Oh, so sure. like this is like like there's a whole bunch of stuff that like everyone was like, yeah, this is the most optimal way to approach. And I I, I was like I was like even in my head I was like yes, this is the most optimal way to approach this. And then I was like when I went to go like actually work it all out, I'm like geez, we've been depending on this other behavior this whole time to do a whole bunch of really cool stuff. What does it look like in this system? So I actually started, that's where the Signals 2.0 stream started. But then afterwards, mm-hmm. I actually started like working through this stuff, which is a little bit of a tangent from this from this stream. It was just, I uh, maybe I'll show it later. Mm-hmm. But it is interesting to me that for an area that's been around for 10 years, longer, there's a certain amount of stuff that we can agree on pretty much of good things, good basis is, but there's still like, we haven't had the maturity here yet to actually explore this in the same re- like degree that other solutions were. Signals kind of went out of fashion for like 12 years and, and like, or maybe 10 years. And now it feels like it's all new again. Like we're, we're, we're making leaps and bounds here at a, such a faster rate. And it comes from like all these other people. Like I was sitting there and I, signals are moving pretty slow through 2016 to 2021. But then the last like two or three years, things have like just accelerated as everyone's kind of going to got on on this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I will answer this question just cause I can, from my perspective, you can give your answer too. The impact signals part of ECMAScript beyond building frameworks. I don't. Do you have an opinion on that? So one of the things we say is like you know, build systems kind of care about dependency tracking and like you know, um, the stuff that signals is trying to do and like the just the basic algorithm underneath like trying to build a graph is actually fairly common. Is that is that what this is about? Like application yeah, I- beyond UI frameworks. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe people are think pick, trying to picture. Like, I think the reason is when we when they released it, they basically suggested this API was for us, and that people probably wouldn't be using it directly. Um, I, that that was my take of it, or like minimally. Like, I don't know. Angular puts you know brings the stuff into classes, and I'm gathering you do as well. We almost all are going to have our own API wrapping over it. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't know. It's I. I think the common, I guess people are still trying to figure out what the what the value is here um, a bit, right? Like, because like the, the the common basis is the value. I actually, this is typical Ryan, but like I don't actually care about what it looks like. Um, mm-hmm. Like the basis is the fact if we're all using the same signals, then it's kind of like using async await, right? Like it's like yeah. can Chrome to Dev Tools track dependencies? Like, can, yeah. can, could we actually, like, see tooling and stuff built into the platform to, to do more? I saw someone complaining that we shouldn't bring it in because it has no value for the back end. And it's an interesting question because, I don't know, signals are, are a synchronization system. So, like, I guess something like RxJS might be more valuable for people on the back end because it's a transformation yeah. system. But, like, don't I mean, you use could have it. servers. Yeah, stateful servers. Yeah. That, mm-hmm. yeah, and it certainly helps during SSR. Like you want to know, like you want to. We're not talking about like signals and resumability yet, right? Like, but when you do, like you you actually need to know like the signals graph uh, or a subset of it during server rendering so that you can like serialize it and then you know resume it. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The idea for the proposal would be that this would like, there would be some ability to optimize at least the the the, the, the propagation and stuff in in native code I'm gathering at the engine level. Um, the idea is that that we like at least the the notification like pr propagation um, would be able to be able to be optimized somewhat. It's hard to say. Like I, I know there's some people out there. I, I think I saw Fabio, who is like, you know, Bobby guy, very critical. If if he has an opinion, I probably agree with him. Just like tr trust what he says. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, he he's like he, on the performance side because he was like, you know, I don't know if this will actually lend to this performance and blah blah blah. And like I'm not gonna pretend I know the impact of like what an implementation in Chrome can do. Let's say if they like get into the V8 level, but it might be minimal on the performance side. If it's considerably slower, I might actually be like, no, I'm not ready for this yet. But let's assume that it's, you know, even if it's not a performance improvement, just having that common base to be able to tap into is a bit, big benefit from my perspective. Dev tooling is something I'm really excited about because like everyone seems to be very concerned that like automatic dependency tracking can get you into trouble because you can't like understand like why something's happening anymore um right yeah yeah, yeah definitely I, I i think this is always uh, a challenge right i mean it was the argument against signals back in the day right it was too chaotic yeah. the funniest thing is <laughs> you take one complicated system and replace it with another one you know is you, we just get there again yeah. um you know some people are hoping for agnosticism Maybe a lot of the work happens in the effects, and I'm very glad the effects are not part of the spec. So, like, we're gonna have to see on this. This is not where I'm actually that worried, uh, concerned about. I know there's a, there's, there's a part like every group has different representatives. Like we had Ben Lesh, who's like RX reactivity guy, pretty stoked on this stuff. He cared a lot about interoperability at the beginning, kind of you know adjusted his view over time a little bit. Um, there, there's other people, you know, on the like more web, you know, oh, even web component people who are involved in this group, um, and the, and the, they're kind of like, yeah, they would love if this meant that the, the the platform could be lower level and that people could just you know do these things without having ten different frameworks, you know. But then there's also framework authors who are like like myself who are like there will always be different frameworks because people have different opinions. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> You know, I don't know. Sorry, I'm talking a lot. Do you, do you have anything to add on that, Jan? Sorry. No, no, I was just agreeing with you. Uh, yeah, yeah we will always have different frameworks because people have different opinions. But yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm trying to decide where 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 we should go from here because we've explained Wiz, we've talked about signals, we've we've talked about a bit about resumability. We kind of I think we got a good idea on on that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know. Do you, is there anything you you want to show, or should we go go in some Q and A, or what what, what? what are you feeling at? Um. Yeah, I think we can go into some Q and A. Um, I don't have anything specific to show. We already looked at like you know some of the HTML, which was uh, nice. Hopefully that was helpful. Um. I I can't really share like code and stuff, so I think That's Q and A might be the best. And I actually have a a question for you because. Okay, I, I got a good one. Some spicy, not 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 spicy in like a get you in trouble way, but spicy in a, a, a kind of way is when okay, Angular and Wiz are merging uh, to a certain degree or using shared pieces. I, the degree to that, you know, and Wiz is a resumable framework. Mm -hmm. Angular today is not, but they both have signals, which is strong base. When Misco came out and put quick out there, he was like, look, resumability is a game changer. Which we agree it's pretty big. But he also suggested that basically no framework could follow in the footsteps. They'd have to do a rewrite or be a new framework or something, right? Unless they already had resumability like like Wiz. What's your opinion about how resumability fits into the future of these frameworks or like the path to resumability? Is this is this something that like we all just need new frameworks to get to or is this kind of like part of the you know progression? Like, what do you feel about that? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, I actually disagree with Mishko on this, and he knows. Um, I think there is a path to resumability that any framework could take. Um, it's about um, starting to care about SSR and then like just 
really, really caring about it. And, and the more you care about it, the more and more resumable you can be. So like, here's a, here's a, here's an exercise, a thought exercise, right? Like, and, and I, I will start by saying like, I'm not a react developer. I don't really know much about it. Um, and so, um, only to the extent that, you know, I work with incremental DOM, but imagine if, you know, you had like react server components and some client components and your server side rendering everything. Right. And then you're like now on the client side. Okay. So you have like this at, at the base, you have a server tree and that's going down into like many different client components. Right. Yeah. Um, and then everywhere you're trying to, your component fetches data, you kind of, you know, you're passing it in as a prop. And so like, you know, it's, it's kind of like content projecting all over the place. Right. And that's um, what server components basically yeah. do. Yeah. That's exactly what I, I think that's exactly what they are. Yeah. And you don't hydrate anything though. Right. You just let it be at that point. You install like an event dispatch library at the other route. And depending on where the user interacts, you call hydrate root on just that client component tree. Right. Yeah. I, I guess that let's, let's just run through this a bit because mm -hmm. the funny thing is, first of all, react does have that global event dispatcher to, to in a certain form, they, they have something called selective hydration where they'll prioritize hydrating suspense boundaries based on if the person interacts with the page before it's, it's done, they will still mm -hmm. actually prioritize on that. And, um, so they, 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 they do have the ability to somewhat delegate events and solid acts is a similar system as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but I guess the question is if you're going to hydrate from a certain entry point of the page, does that mean you like, like you, where are you getting the props from, from those components is like, can they have no props? Are they like, do you have to serialize them? I'm just trying to picture. That's, that's the thing, right? So like we said, like resumability is like not just event handlers, also data. So you, you solve the event handler piece by actually having, so you're saying react will do the delegation, but then how does like, without some kind of attribute, like JS action, all you sent is HTML. What do you know? Like, how do you decide whether a component cares about like, do you just hydrate all the components as soon as there's a single click? Uh, I feel you do need some information at at the actual element level saying, hey, these are the events I care about, right? And right. so then you can like actually do like proper selective hydration uh, where you just don't hydrate things where the user's not interacted with it, right? Like menu bar to the left, users never clicking on it, just let it be. Um, and, and then, you have the serialization problem. And then as soon as you have the serialization problem, you, you try to optimize it uh, somehow, right? You, you try to say, oh, okay, there's props and there's, there, there's params in this data and, and the data will be at the bottom and the params will be on the top. Or, uh, I mean, you can go down that path and like, you know, actually start trying to, it depends on how much you care about SSR. And if you really just don't care about SSR, um, this journey down being resumable will kind of, at some point you'll realize like you'll feel you probably feel like it's not worth it. The the thing is, I, I think a lot of frameworks have shown that they do care about SSR. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's been the kind of the trend the last couple of years. Actually, Jack had a question. I'm, what I'm curious, if an existing framework could, could be useful, how would use effect work, for example, and also be backward compatible with this immediate eager execute? Yeah, I mean there are I think in all cases there's gonna be some code that might you might want to uh, run yeah. eagerly anyways, yeah. but I guess it's the same rules. You can pretend that's like an event that someone clicked immediately. Yeah. In fact, it is, is kind of like an page is some, if you're somehow rel relying on use effect to like correct the rendered page and like, if it doesn't run immediately, the page is incorrect. Now you're like either trying to run use effect on the server or like you're stuck. Oh. All right. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, do you know, an example of this page correction, pretty common problem with hydration and we use use effects so it doesn't run on the server is applying light mode, dark mode um, from that's stored in local storage. Yeah. Uh, th th that is a kind of like a classic example mm -hmm. of it. Um, yeah, what kind of code do we run use effect or on mount? Um, sometimes measuring things that have been rendered in the DOM after they've been rendered so that we can pick things up for the next interaction, like... Uh, I mean, that's already animation. not going to work on the server uh, unless right. you're doing something very sophisticated. Right. Well, the yeah. thing is we don't use use effect. It doesn't run on the server, it only runs on the client. Right. So like essentially these are, there's a bunch of these things that run only in the client on mount. Yeah. Um, they're okay. I, I like, the, I guess the thing is what would happen is in these cases and is that it you would, tr it'd be like unfortunate, but you would treat it like 
um, an, like an event that always fires when the page opens. So you're like, okay, yes, we closed over this state um, because we need to, you know, grab this value when the thing runs. What Quick ended up doing is that they changed their default for use effect to be uh, uh, on visible um, instead mm -hmm. of on mount, which is a little bit breaking um, perhaps, mm -hmm. but it's an interesting, it's an, like there's nothing wrong as long as you could again serialize the closure or have some way of hoisting out this code, the same problem as yeah. the event handler problem. There's nothing wrong with this other than just the fact that like, I think you start thinking differently. Like my, my animation example is instead of using use effects to grab it on a mount, you'll just grab it when you first need to do the thing you, yeah. you know, later. You just defer doing stuff. You start stuff. getting lazier and lazier, which finally <laughs> like, you know, then then you can actually start thinking about code splitting because we're not doing close code splitting yet, right? Like in my little thought exercise so far, you're still loading all the client components. You're just choosing when to like hydrate them. And then you start thinking, oh, what if I actually start like, because now things are lazier and lazier. What if I actually don't load this event handler or what if I have an API that will just, you know, let me, cause I'm listening to the events, right? Like you put yeah. it in HTML. So you're still listening to the events. You don't need the event handler to start listening to it. Right. So what if you didn't load it, right? Like what if it's a super expensive event handler and you just want to, you know, late load it. And yeah. then you have multiple entry points on the page. And like, I don't really understand fully if 3P is well set up to do multiple entry points on the page or if it's common practice. Um, so that might be a challenge. Mm. I guess this is a related question. Mm. Does Wiz have some kind of lifecycle events in addition to DOM events? You know, you were talking about like, an event, a global event that's fired that would start all the use effects. Like we have that, we just call it the render event. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So there's a few like life yeah. cycles. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there's like a render event and you can like wake up your component on render and then like do some stuff that you really want to get done as soon as possible. Um, in, sorry, side note, this is increment. There is an incremental module from OCaml. Oh, like incremental? Is that like the thing from Jamestown? Um, uh, similar to signals and probably using business. Okay. Yeah. If this is what I think it is, Milo gushes about this library all day long. He's a huge, huge fan. Um, uh, I think with the language level, something like camel, you can do some stuff that we can't do in JavaScript, um, as easily. Um, but yeah, I don't, I, that's all I know about incremental. Do you know much about incremental? No, yeah, I, I know Milo gushes about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I, I think, I think there's some confusion about, well, I, it depends on how you define resumability. Still, there's some benefit to resumability when doing pure CSR. First render bundle can be split from interactivity bundle. Um, is, is it like, I guess what, it depends on what you bucket under resumability. Would you say this is true? Like how? I, yeah, it is true. Uh, and it's not just this, it's also that, you know, you can get your initial render faster. And, and it's all because you don't need to install event handlers. And so not only are you not doing add event listener during rendering, you're actually able to just render to a string and inner HTML it. And, See, and that is interactive. Yeah. So, the, so, so because of that, because of that whole, like the resumability is JS action, right? Like, so because you don't need to attach event listeners to respond to events, you just inner HTML it. And it also means you don't, you, what, what's said here, right? Like you can code split. Yeah, I, I wonder, like, part of you makes me wonder how close all it is to what you consider resumability. The reason I, I, I ask that is because, I mean, let me share my screen for two seconds here, because uh, I don't know, let, let, let me open the playground here. The funny thing is we don't, okay, see this on click? Remember this? Uh, yeah. 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 You know, if you look here, we, we don't do it as an attribute. We do it as a property. Mm-hmm. Right. I guess the problem is we're not doing the closure stuff. But what I'm getting at is, yeah, see, if we made this an attribute, because this is read by the event delegate, and then we do event replaying. What, why do you have an event delegate? Like, what is the, what is it well, you're trying to, yeah. Uh, it does, it, we ca we do event replaying. So we capture all the events before it's hydrated and then replay ah, them as they hydrate. Okay. Um, that that was we also had event delegation because of the JS framework benchmark and people told me that when we manually did delegation that was cheating, and I was like, oh. and then I was like, okay, fine, let me try it, and then it became useful for things like portals, 
um, and like right. things inserted like uh, the, outside the DOM. It just kept on finding more uses for event delegation. But what's mm -hmm. interesting to me, I suppose, is if if we if we yeah like it's it's really the difference between like on this like let's see what how's the server side rendering the server skips it but if on the server side we set an attribute then it yeah it, it's like i guess you but still then, need to then, know then where just, this code yeah. you, you need to know where this code is is the is the thing well yeah i mean the value of the attribute has to be a key into something that tells you where that is yeah where the code is yeah, all right so you, so solid let's let's do this we're gonna make solid resumable <laughs> solid start is resumable yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know how we would actually. You, I you mean, said it. Make it an attribute. Right. So let's let, let's just mental exercise this for a minute first. Mm -hmm. Just a thing. Let's say on the, because we have this code on the server. Let, we made this into an attribute. Mm -hmm. So that's fine. The attribute would have a key, and that we'd use that key to, like, the part I don't understand is I'm trying to think about is how do we wire this. Com so do you also want to do code splitting or for now you could, I don't care about codes. I don't yeah. care about codes. So then just, yeah. uh, so, so, so then like, just make it up. So you can do like hydratable resumability, which is kind of weird. <laughs> what I mean by that is, um, you're because if you're not doing code splitting, you're, you're going to load the rendering path anyway. Right. And so yeah. you're, you're going to load a whole bunch of JavaScript, um, and, and you're going to run through it as well. So like, if you're willing to do like a, like a patch like yeah i mean like this this is the, the, Wait, the tricky, yeah no the yeah i think part. i think because you already have event delegation you you you're you're all you're doing is you're you're also rendering an attribute during ssr but yeah, then you, but then you, you, you need serialization as a baseline right you, you need a way of like because let's pretend we did something really not granular yeah. you you we would let's say we knew what component we we need to not only tell like let's say we could from the click handler know what component we needed to run let's say yeah. like this just pointed at an identifier for components yeah. we that component in, instance would have to have a serialized version of the props or something for us yeah. to actually make and, that and, an entry and, point and and if it's using context it would also need like all the context serialized at that boundary yeah yeah um and then yeah, yeah. and so yeah so, says misco right no um no i think it's it's it's, it's like doable. you make a higher order function that actually does that right like you introduce right. a new type of component you call it a container like that's what we need we need more types of components not more web frameworks <laughs> yeah container it's funny yeah that, i was talking to someone the other day and i was i was suggesting well because we the thing is you could be careful introducing too many different concepts but mm -hmm. the thing is we have a concept already we have a couple concepts that are verging on the container idea we have suspense and another one that's verging on the container idea is the sections in nested routing. Like the like every nested route section is an example of, of like a container. Usually its data is contained only within its scope, except for global context. And it doesn't get any props other than the router props mm -hmm. from that perspective on. So you just only have the, the, the router props or the data that you're fetching from the route data loader. I don't mm -hmm. know if, so in a sense, if you just took that pattern that we use in route sections and made it into a primitive that could be used on its own, independent of the router, yeah, then you could have coarser grained resumability, not even resumability, but like, well, no resumability, right? Because yeah, it's resumability because you, you can you it's it's letting you run lesser code, like it's it's letting you skip like full app hydration, like like the key is to like not need to do full app hydration anymore. Right. And the, I guess the reason it's still resumability is because we're also, because we have a serialization boundary, mm -hmm. we are also not um, running the code in, immediately. We're not running an initial hydration pass. I, mm -hmm. I think the place we get into trouble, uh, this, the, the reason I, I landed here, sorry, I, I, I write too many of these little blobs. And this is, again, probably, oh yeah, sorry, where is it? Serialization no, no, where is it? Uh, da, 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 three, presumability without serialization. I wrote an article a while ago where I I basically said, forgot about the containers and was like, I think this is basically what we were talking about. Um, oh no, I was trying to do something more granular. Yeah, never mind. This probably would take us too long. I was thinking of like if you could unwind the code. But then ensured that it was in the same scope without code splitting, so you wouldn't need quick dollar signs. 
but you would still keep do the closure extraction kind of, yeah. but but don't serialize it essentially, so that yeah, you could but, have mm-hmm. the that you could have the code execute at from these entry points, but mm-hmm. you wouldn't have to worry about serialize it because they they wouldn't be the they wouldn't be the the. The, you have to get the props somehow, though. And to get the props, you're going to have to run the components above, like between the serialization boundary and like the component you want to. Reserve. Right, right, right. Exactly. That was the, yeah. the that was the the problem with, with this generally, because um, yeah. even though it's kind of granular, you would I'd pull up along the reactive graph. The the way yeah. I got the props was instead of running the components, was pull the reactive graph. Oh, because you, oh right, because these are just functions. You could pull on the, but every yeah. prop is a reactive. Is it reactive then? Yeah, or or it was not reactive, which means it can never change. Yeah, but then you need to serialize it. Right. Well, you you just keep on pulling up until you get a get a value, and the value will either be in the it'll be in the JavaScript code, or it will be from an async source. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean. It's fine. I, I think the serialization could help contain it, so you didn't have to yeah. make it. But okay, this is interesting, though. So we're in agreement. There, there, there could be something here. We just yeah. like I, I feel like there's thing, a... you, just, you got to care about SSR. Like you just really keep caring about it till you get to this point. Um, and and I, I don't I don't I don't think you just immediately jump to like oh it's impossible. Like you could incrementally get there. Interesting, uh, Greg. Gr- Gr- Ask me a question. Does does lazy work on an event listener? The idea is like, what if you like made by almost like a like this a lazy hydratable container? Like there's a, the, in React and Solid, we have this thing that's a lazy renderable container. What if you actually yeah. let it wake up on event listener? Yeah. Then like, is it resumable? Uh, you just need to serialize the props that you closed over inside the lazy. Right. Because that's the boundary, right? Like so that right, exactly. And then it is resumable. Yeah, actually, you know, you're right. It is. So if you just said, for example, that hey, this event listener will just make sure that whatever props it needs are present in the data dash attribute, right? Then then that's it. That's all you need. You need a lazy boundary around an event listener, and then the event listener wakes up, grabs whatever it needs from data dash, and never assumes that it closes over anything, and that's resumable. Yeah. I, it's interesting space to explore. I, I, I think I think you definitely got me thinking more about like this um, thing, you know, in terms of thing. One one of the cool things about we're solid is, and I know that I'm kind of turned it a bit here, is we're so primitive focused already that we don't have a lot of that baggage um, in terms of like we don't have a VDOM or uh, or you know some create like these other pieces that we have to do. So we're fairly portable to try ideas like this because of how low level the pieces are. So yeah, maybe it's something I'll, I'll play with here, not to get too far off. Um, I'm trying to get, see if I got some more questions in the chat here. Um, Let's see. Build an index. I mean, control flow, I think is still con- challenging with these kind of things. If you don't have keys or something, um, that's one of the challenges because we, we we don't we don't need keys in the clients. We can use references. So Saul has never had keys. What's also interesting about control flow is like imagine on the server, like you had an if component and the server side you rendered like you know the true branch. On the client, you actually need to load the false branch. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a server component. It's funny. So you don't actually get away from these boundaries. The biggest difference here is, yeah. I mean, so I guess even with Wiz or something like, are we? It's like, so do we still need something like server components, like a use client or whatever? It doesn't have to use client, but like a, a boundary that's set that's saying this is this. Use client might not need to be the the actual like hydration entry point. It just needs to be like the the serialization boundary. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. Uh, I think uh, isomorphic components can actually work. Like, I think what happens is if you already have a deep client tree, and then you decide to like fetch some data. Now you have to like actually reverse prop drill to make it to project that content from the closest server component boundary. And then God forbid you made like a shared client component tree and like there are two different server components. Like now that's part of your like public API. So your API went from just call this component to call this component and remember to pass this child. Um, do you know? Do you see what I'm talking about? Maybe not. I'm trying to think here because there, there, there are some rules we have where uh, you can't import a server component into a client component. Yeah. So, like, like, what I'm trying to say is, like, you know, uh, 
if you manage to get this working and your components can fetch their own data regardless of whether they are client or server components, which is isomorphic, right? Like right. you asked me, like, do you still need to use client? With isomorphic components, any component can fetch its own data. You don't need to have this restriction that if it's fetching its data, its parent has to be another component that is capable of fetching its data. Like in server components, you, when you start writing your server component tree, at yeah. some point you decide to get into a client component tree because like, you know, you need hooks or something. Yeah. And then after like say five levels of the client component, you end up needing a component that wants to fetch its own data. What you do is you actually project it. So it. You go yeah. five levels up and you have to content project the server component right. that fetches yeah. its own data. So like from that server components point of view, the API to render that client component tree just went from call a single function and give it props yeah. to call a function, give it props and remember to also give it this child. Yeah. Because the I child fetches its own data. Right. And that's so, like it's breaking encapsulation of that client component tree. Yeah, I, well, it, it depends. Uh, I mean, the React perspective is that all children are also props. So like, oh, right. Well, so, yeah. Okay. It's a fancier prop, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it, so like, yeah, but this is part of the challenge and the difficulty here because a prop across that boundary gets serialized eagerly where otherwise, like if, in our case, it could be, uh, oh, oh, is it? There's like a weird thumbs up that showed up on my screen. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, it could be done eagerly where this, you know, uh, so like for us, our props are lazy, for example, generally speaking. So like, it's kind of odd to, to, you know what I mean? Like when you, as you said, you, you render both branches, right? Like if there's a, sh like, it doesn't matter if the client shows or hides it, you, you, you render both branches if they're server props, you know, like mm -hmm. it's part of the serialization, which is probably why it's, well, it's not probably, it's why it's really complicated for React to solve the double data problem. Um, whereas Astro's awareness of slots probably helps them a little bit. And anyway, it's... it's <laughs> yeah, I think we're like very deep now. We're very deep I mean, now, yeah. yeah. I'm... I, I, levels and then, you know, it's like two, yeah. two and a half hours almost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's all good. We, we, this is usually where I start wrapping up with the guests. I'd make sure I didn't miss any other... Um, Good questions in here while we were getting off topic. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about existing frameworks. Um, we talked, I don't know if there's much more to, uh, yeah, not much about incremental DOM. You guys, you guys are moving away from incremental DOM then anyway. We're not like yet. We haven't decided to like move away from it. We're just exploring signals to see whether it can solve some of the challenges that we're seeing with incremental DOM and then we'll decide. Right. Who knows? Yeah. You guys might even have a fine grained renderer. Who knows? Mm -hmm. Um, we do. Yeah. I'm just sc scrolling and make sure this is your chance. If you have any more questions for Jadin, um, is there any website built with Wiz performance in the green area? <laughs> Oh man, I guess this YouTube. We know what's going on. I don't know. Google dot com is it green? I th I think it might be in the yellow. Like it might be in the, like I, 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 the only reason. Uh, the, I mean, we could try it. I the, my gut here is this is something that people always underestimate. E eBay dot com lighthouses at like I want to say like. 39 or 40 like in, in that range it is it's it's like not good right and people are like well you worked on marco blah, blah blah it's a super fast website why why does it do that and the funny thing is when you talk internally at ebay and everyone's like working on the framework and the testing stuff our pages are tested you know without all the other junk without the ads all that stuff you know and it's lightning fast spend so much time making sure the javascript payloads and obviously like there's mistakes that are made and you know developers are developers and we, we we have a team checking we had a team checking for regressions checking like oh this page is like slowed x number milliseconds and they like go to the product team and see like hey what's going on and we, all the stuff and then you go and the final result is you know you know uh like below 50 on 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 page speed and people are like well you did all this work on a performant framework. Like it's almost like they don't believe you. And they're like, I'm just gonna use react. Cause it gives me, you know, 94% are on my hello world app. 
or maybe no, but like I think React can get a hundred on a Hello World, maybe ninety eight or ninety nine. But like you, you get my you get my point. Mm. So sometimes when this question comes out, it's like I I feel like maybe there's like a difference between expectation of what it, a, a site ends up looking like, like even Google dot com compared to, um, you know your your personal blog site. Um, I don't know. I feel like that was part of what uh, Dimitri was asking on the other thread when the, the previous thread after the announcement, because he was like, he wasn't just talking about YouTube. He was, he was actually posting page speed stuff from yeah. a whole bunch of Google sites. And he was like, it's, you know, you know, like there's, there's some seventies in there, or, you know, like kind of yellow zones stuff. And it's like, if this is so fast, why, why aren't these green? Well, it's just part of the whole thing, right? Like, finally, these are businesses and they see a different kind of green. Like, as long as the business is working and, like, the app is meeting the need that it's designed to meet, performance is one aspect of why people come to the website. Right, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Uh, offhand, I don't know. You, pro you probably don't lighthouse many of the, of the sites yourself. You're not sitting there testing that. You guys are doing... A different kind of testing performance stuff yeah we like, we look more at like product metrics so like um how much time did it take to like serve a search result or something like that um and and those product metrics are like tied more closely to like the specific parts of the product that that the business cares about the most uh i thought uh, that's an interesting question from eisenberg effect actually yeah. and yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is this is interesting. I, I do feel like there is something missing in like the web platform around deferred event handlers. Like I know technically in HTML, you can just actually have a little bit of JavaScript serialized into the initial page response, but then like it's not recommended. Instead, you should use add event listener. As soon as the web started recommending add event listener, we created a problem. And the problem was that there is now this like gap and you need like some kind of event dispatch library uh, and you need to start like having attributes like JS action so that you don't drop events. And I think this is like very, very fundamental. And like if that gets addressed somehow in the platform itself, then yeah, then I don't think that need resumability. But till that's not addressed, you do need something to avoid dropping those events. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of the, yeah, I mean, one of the challenges I'm still working on with all these kind of boundary systems is the, just handling um, asynchronicity as as well. Um, the, there's a, there's just a lot of details in terms of the serialization of when stuff is available. Every like almost everything needs to once you make one thing async, everything kind of becomes async. Well, it, it depends. Like, but well, you think about bubbling, right? Like as soon as you have a deferred event handler, you're like wrecking havoc on like the bubble and the capture phase. Like what is even going to, what is even yeah. supposed to happen? You have a replay phase now and like, yeah. 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 I mean, this has been one of the, actually the kind of part of the challenge here too, right? Like uh, uh, if, if, if we do event replays um, and the person, you know, canceled the event, like do, do we assume they canceled the event, like the native event? because we can't find that out until we actually run it. I know, I think Quick has yeah. a special syntax for it. That's why even though Solid has replay, if you click an anchor tag, mm -hmm. I, you know, things that have, or submit a form or something fast enough, we'll, we'll, we'll fall back to progressive enhancement. Um, it would be cool in some cases where you'd be like, no, no, actually, I, I don't want to fall back to progressive enhancement, actually, because mm -hmm. I know that's going to freaking reload the whole page on my user and, you know, make them wait another X number of seconds because it already took them that long. That's why they're clicking on it. Yeah. Um, I, I would yeah. like to just finish the the process, you know, right. um, but I don't know this at the time that they click it because, you know, these things have yeah. to happen synchronously. Yeah, it's interesting. So event handling is really the key part here then around around resumability. Yeah. And then the data serialization is like, you know, there's many, many options for it. Like, so that's probably, it's kind of like the event handler is like the watcher and then the effect is the data serialization, right? Like there's a difference, like some frameworks, different frameworks will handle serialization in a different way, but we need something in the platform to help us with events. Otherwise we're all going to make the same, you know, JS action like library. That's cool. That's good. Yeah. Maybe that's our next opportunity here. I uh, think so. All right. Um, I'm good on stuff then, I think, uh, mm -hmm. Jaden. Um, I, we've given people enough chance to ask their 
their their questions and I, I thank you Eisenberg effect for the for the good technical one there right at the end um, <laughs> yeah yeah another proposal to work on let's do it <laughs> um, so yeah no I think we're good to go um, I think we'll let Jaden go and uh, we'll we'll continue this st the stream on after that so thank you very much for joining me today um, I've learned a lot give me definitely give me some things to think about um, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what this future with you know angular and whiz is going to look like um, and just how this uh, kind of continues to evolve um, is there anyone you want to give shout outs to or any shout outs? yeah um, well first of all thank you a lot for having me on the stream like it's super exciting and like I feel like this is one of the high points of my career like you know, being on on your stream, I should just retire tomorrow. Happy man. <laughs> so yeah, thanks a lot for doing this. This is really awesome, and like you know, huge huge shout out to you know Angular and especially folks inside YouTube, right? Like we couldn't have we couldn't have gotten as far as we did, and like you know, uh, especially on like the signals library stuff. Like I had we we had like a lot of you know YouTube engineers actually developing. So. Yeah, yeah, I want to give a shout out to them. I know one guy at least is listening, Simone, uh, you know, shout out to you and Chris. And it was really nice uh, working with you guys. I forgot one thing, sorry. Uh, I, I Just before you go, um, yeah. can you tell us why Wiz is called Wiz? Ah, <laughs> so there was a time when we were, um, yeah, we were naming a lot of stuff after the Wizard of Oz. Uh, so we had names for things like Emerald Sea uh, from Emerald City, um, Wiz after the Wizard of Oz, and there's something called Tin, and there's something called uh, TikTok, and there's something called Bok. All of these things, entities, characters, or stuff from the Wizard of Oz. Um, these are all real things that Googlers work with every day, and you know, they're all kind of 10 years old at this point, and uh, they all had this inception from like, you know, the glorious moment we had around coming together to make G+. Right, right. So interesting. So this, these are all secret code names for Google projects. That's yeah. That, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I didn't even click on me until you, you mentioned it. I made this stream cover because I was like, I was like, whiz, and like thinking of references, I'm Wizard Oz, and I'm like, oh, like behind the curtain, like, you know, see what's going on at Google. But then, like, it turns out it's actually named after that. So, yeah. very, very cool to hear. Almost is using F words for everything. Uh, but <laughs> clearly, a uh, stab at meta. But um, yeah. All right. All right. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, yeah. till next time, I look forward to chatting more. Um, see you later, yeah. Jen. Bye. Uh, that was awesome. Um, I hope we didn't lose you too much in some of that technical uh, stuff. Um, I definitely had a few questions for Jan, and I haven't talked to him, you know, in a few weeks. So I definitely wanted to take that opportunity. I hope we all learned something along the process. Because, um, yeah, definitely very, very cool. I I always love talking with him and a few of the other experts, especially around the reactivity, resumability area great guest to have on. I'm gl glad we've had him on now. Um, I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to have him on again in the future. Um, <laughs> gonna have to rewatch the whole thing at least twice. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting to see how much things are moving still. Like you can have these technologies that have been around for a while, but the stuff's still shifting in this space. We're like constantly on this path to optimize both user experience and developer experience. So yeah, uh, yeah, no, very exciting stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, the, we we don't know the answer to these questions completely, right? Like, I I was trying to drill a bit about the data splitting stuff. Like, there's so many aspects. That's what you said from a framework level. What's kind of cool with Wiz is they like they didn't take responsibility for that. They had a very clear responsibility around the the handling of like executing the right code for the right events. That was the whole focus around it, not what that code actually did. So like the, if there's trade-offs, the developers who built whatever with Wiz would figure out what those trade-offs are. I'm trying to approach this from like a declarative or more framework, you know, higher level uh, becomes challenging because we, you know, we can make assumptions that are wrong. You know, how much serialization is required? All these kind of things require more experimentation and more thinking. So um, yeah, definitely. Um, 
definitely something very cool. Yeah, I, I want to take a second here. Sorry, I, I missed this earlier on uh, Twitch, but Insanity later gifted a whole bunch of subs um, uh, earlier in the stream, at least six or seven. Thank you very much um, and th for, for the subs. And also it looks like, yeah, uh, they sub again themselves currently for 18 months. Wow. Almost two years of, you know, on the stream. Thank you very much for, for giving those subs out and for staying here as a constant part of the stream. Um, very, very cool. Thank you. So is resumability basically just deferred event handling lulls? No, I mean, the key part, it's tricky. I, we showed it before. It's tricky to defer event. Like, it's not like you just like, like I wouldn't consider it resumability if you just like, I mean, this is where Janin and Misko probably differ a little bit. And then why I think like we have to actually see it. It's not just like, okay, now you click event, now we hydrate. Like that doesn't gain us anything you need to be able to reduce the amount of code to run. Ideally, like as Jan was talking with Wiz, like they 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 were kind of destructive initially. So it wouldn't ever hydrate because it would just on change, render the, the new thing, right? Inner HTML. So it's not just deferring hydration. It's, 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 it's it's also never running that code to hydrate, or at least the majority of it. Um, to do that, though, it does start with event handling, right? So, yeah. Um, what do, what else do I want to talk about? I I actually want to take a moment to talk about. Um, uh, I don't think I'm going to talk about my signal stuff. I, I did, I did write a new thing about how we could handle rendering and signals and stuff, but I, I think I'm going to save that for another stream. I actually also wrote a thing a few weeks back about how, how I think we should benchmark. Can we talk about benchmarking for a minute? Yeah, let's talk about, let's talk about benchmarking for a minute because I feel like it's a topic. Um, I, it's funny enough, my stream on benchmarking is probably my least popular stream to date. But, um, you know, let's do it. Because I'm going to go... I wanna... Now, where is my profile? Sorry. I'm going to go here because I wrote, I wrote this on Twitter. Benchmarking Hello World SSR. God. Uh, this is clearly a subtweet. Benchmarking is easy. Unintentionally cheating benchmarks is easier. Creating useful benchmarks is hard. Having those benchmarks be fair is harder. Um, reason I wanted to bring this up or say this is because I get people benchmark stuff a lot. And I always hear it with Solid 2, like on the positive side, where people are like, oh, I, I took this React app and I or I took the Solid example and Solid's way faster. And it's like, yeah, I mean, the thing's not doing anything. You're seeing how fast you can update text. Obviously, the thing that doesn't have to diff and literally just sets the text node is going to be faster than pretty much any other framework out there, right? No component re-render, like even less than Svelte, you know, like, you know, this, yes. If, if, if I wrote a vanilla routine that just said, set this text, you know, as fast as possible over and over again, that'd be even faster than using the reactive system. But what I, I sometimes isn't always obvious um, is that you can make assumptions that actually cheat the benchmarks, so to speak, right? Where you do things where like unintentionally you skew, skew the results of your benchmark. Perfect example of this um, was some of those early tests, uh, sorry, sorry, Aiden, um, with MillionJS comparing the performance to React. Um, and preact and basically there was there was some overhead in the benchmark that kind of skewed it this can also happen when i i first entered the js framework benchmark um with solid i wasn't doing some things that were required and i didn't realize why and i didn't think they would make a difference and guess what they actually did make a difference um when i implemented it initially um solid was like much faster and i was like thought you know haha i knew this would be really fast 
But the reality of it, it was, you know, it wasn't nearly as fast as I thought it was because I would miss some details, right? It's very easy to to make a mistake um, and kind of cheat a benchmark. Yeah, I'm not even talking about observation bias yet. That's, 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 but on the other hand, creating benchmarks, measuring things that are useful is actually really hard because there's this tension between measuring something that's small, like that is measurable, and measuring something that's realistic but hard to implement. Like not everyone's going to implement a full app to the same spec. You have to keep it small enough that you, you can actually make different points of comparison, but also um, large enough that you, you know, you can basically like be simulating something that at least has some realistic relevant aspect to it. I just let us talk that shit about next year's. I suppose so, but I, I, you know, everyone knows I take benchmarking seriously. And the problem is even after you make something that's um, useful, you might still like, it might not be fair. Like you might have designed the whole benchmark just to like, like showcase this one aspect, you know, and maybe this is a question of how useful it is, but showcase of one aspect that might not actually matter or in a lot of cases or something like it's like stuff can be useful for a framework author and completely not useful for the users of said framework. So yeah, I mean, we all know where this started. I probably didn't even bookmark the actual tweet at this point, but it's not too hard to find the, the, uh, the, the poster behind it. Right. Um, probably posts too much a day that I'm not even going to find it right now. Here. Benchmarks aren't useless. I'm kind of tired of people saying benchmarks are useless, but okay. But on the other hand, lots of benchmarks are useless. <laughs> right? Benchmarks aren't useless. Lots of benchmarks are useless. This one where it started actually hugely flawed because the, at least if it's the exact the, 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 for for multiple reasons right first of all rendering a hello world well it depends on what you're testing let's see here if you're just testing the overhead of the framework then then i guess this is fair because rendering hello world doesn't actually test how fast the framework renders right it doesn't actually test like you, you, like spitting a string out. So I, I'll, I'll grant it this. This original test is actually not the worst in that if you're just like, how much to start to like, if I if I had AWS and I was running AWS and I was like, uh, you know, if I take my cold start plus framework startup on a request or whatever, like wh what, what am I dealing with? Right. What what matters more than benchmark is ease of locality reason, useful abstraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean sure. It, it, as long as you're in the same ballpark. And in some cases, we aren't actually completely in the same ballpark. But this, I, I actually think that the Next.js complaint here has some, it has potential that it should be investigated, is, is what, what, what I should put out here. But the, where this started is that, like, it's 170 times slower than the same thing in pure react. So people went and they built the, up the, the next version of this benchmark where instead of doing a hello world, um, they, they, you know, added some more frameworks, they added, um, some data and we ended up with this benchmark showing almost the exact same results again, um, as when they added solid, which solid, you know, slightly behind react. And then next remix and all the other frameworks. I think Svelte comes in around the same place as Solid. But note the problem with this benchmark is, yes, it's 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 sending data now, like rows. So it's doing some rendering. But the React you don't see it in this version. But someone had a version where they they put uh, where is it? Yeah, the, it's the version that uh, that Evan Yu is using here. See this duplication thing where you notice all the ones that are times one, let me blow this up a bit so you can see it. 
are faster than all the ones that are times two? It's because these are the ones that are actually sending data required for hydration. These apps actually don't send the data for hydration. So you're basically doubling the payload because, you know, like basically either you choose to to use an example that's hydratable or you choose to use an example that's not. Some of these are streaming and some of these are not, which also makes a difference too. Basically, if you notice here that all base one Xers, because they're not doing the same thing, in which case Svelkit is the fastest and solid right behind it, which is actually consistent with what I've seen. I think Svelkit actually is slightly faster than us on async, then remix, and then um, next page is the next. Or you do this test, which is the same as that benchmark test that I showed you guys a while ago, the SSR one, um, where you basically don't include hydration data, you do synchronous rendering, no streaming. And yeah, I mean, th that's the classic Marco test, right? And in fact, Marco, couldn't help but get in on this as well, right? This isn't Marco 6, so I can talk about it. But the funniest thing is a bunch of people posted their numbers. People even using like other languages and stuff. I think Marco is actually the highest score um, on this test, just on a side note. What I'm trying to say is like, it's also 1x. Basically, I'll accept 1x from a islands framework in theory because you know they could have saved on the serialization because of the way they did the double data. But any actual framework here, who are you kidding yourself? Like either like you you're either built like the problem is the React in the original example was cheating it. So like if you were actually doing the same thing, of course Sol is way faster than React. Of course Svelte is way faster than React. In fact, most things are way faster than React. But but that's not what you should be looking at here. The only part of the, you basically look at all the twos or look at all the ones, but looking at this is basically meaningless. Well, that's the funny thing. When I did those benchmarks previously for the SSR benchmark, I made a vanilla version of the, like the basically the one times thing. Cause I wanted to know how much faster I can make solid. Solid was already the fastest, multiple times faster than any other framework. And I was like, how can I make it faster? Um, so I made the vanilla version. That's actually the right advice. You need to find the right baseline. If two is what you want to do, then make a vanilla version that does what two does. So I'm giving Next.js, I mean, Next.js does look really pitiful here where it, like you have to understand this is solid base, but solid base and solid start are almost identical. Like it's the same streaming. Our base rendering has all the serialization built in kind of, uh, you know, like it basically does all the things that you get in the meta framework. If someone just picks up solid, you get all the auto, you know, it's why our resources just work. Everything we, our primitives basically work on SSR the way they work in a meta framework. But so when you're comparing say spell kit, solid start remix, they're, they're in the same ballpark. Right. Then next pages is a bit slower. This one seems slower than I expect. Actually, my experience is next is very close to remix. So I don't know if they've screwed up on next here as well. So my, my general feeling here is that our if is that RSCs might be significant, like in the app directory might be significantly slower than the pages, but from this benchmark, just because of my previous experience of looking at other benchmarks, I suspect that, yes, I suspect that while next is clearly the slowest, probably, um, this is probably exaggerated. Yeah. I mean, the, the, there, there is, there is some amount of router overhead, I guess, but this, but the, do you know what the, know what the problem is? I feel like people who, who know better have gone into this conversation and 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 kind of skewed the narrative like like look 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 like let's be fair the marco guys know what's up benchmarks are misleading but like they're they're, they're joking around right but my, my my concern with this stuff 
is like uh, uh, no, 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 no. Sorry, this this one here. Uh, no, not this bookmarks. Let's let's look at a few of these. Added vanilla Svelte for shits and giggles. Now I'm wondering what we can do that we still have Svelte Kits router. It's not Svelte Kits router that why Svelte is so much faster. This version is the One X version, kind of like the the React one, which shows unsurprisingly that Svelte is about seven times faster than the React. That's consistent with what I know. However, it's not doing the data serialization, so it's like it, this has nothing to do with. Svelte Kits router, it's because this is basically cheating the benchmark, right? Like, it's not streaming, it's not hydrating, it's not a completely fair test. Since Svelte does, yeah, no, like, it, this is just not even comparable, right? Right, again, this is consistent. Svelte at about 4,000, Marco's about 6,000, right? Like, this is where I would expect for a 1.0. Oh, X test. You're just comparing the things. You know, again, all these view ones are now one X. Again, this doesn't matter. You guys ship JavaScript, right? You you, you hydrate. Anything like I, I some people saw this like, oh, it made view two times faster in this benchmark. Well, do you think Evan would have missed a two X gain on something that was actually useful? This this is this is just you know, like, I, I mean, if it does, if it did improve the performance of of the synchronous rendering, I do want to check it out. This is actually what he found here is interesting. But basically, the whole comparison here is completely like it's just, as I said, not benchmarking is not useless. Some benchmarks are useless. Like this, this is just, you know, it's interesting to see. Like, I think there's a pre -act. All the framework authors jumped on it, this one, and it's just like, guys, you know that this doesn't actually show anything. I don't know. That's that's why I wrote my, my, my tweet, because it's just like, everybody who jumped in made a 1x example to get to the top of that list. And it's just like, if we're comparing to next, let's be realistic here, at least, and try and make, you know, a streaming version that you know handles async data hydration you know something at least in the ballpark of being comparable but you know this is what sensationalism is on twitter and to be fair yeah or astro and to be fair even then it depends on what the app is, because if it's interactive, then it it should be 2x. Like, it depends on what, what the, the rows are. But yes, I, I could see that argument. But yes, I, granted, right? Any framework that hydrates, this is like just sidestepping. It. It's like, yeah, guess what? We can ship a version with no JavaScript. How many of you guys are doing that? Yeah, well, I mean, this is the, this this is this is the difference, right? I take benchmarking seriously. I think benchmarking is important. Anyway, uh, I, I mean, you could just see the difference, right? Because, like, all benchmarks are meaningless, right? That's that's Rich's perspective. I disagree. That's fine. We have the different perspective. You know, I think this is actually some of my initial friction. Me and Rich get along good now, but some of my initial friction with the whole thing before I knew Rich was, I remember one of his talks and he he referenced a bunch of benchmarks, which were known in the community to basically be useless. And he, and he, and he used that in one of his talks to show salt was 20 times faster than React. And again, he did it in a joking manner, but I was like, I remember the first time seeing that being like, man, this just propagates so much mis information for people who are actually trying to be accurate and trying to like explore and understand the, the characteristics or behaviors of these things. But yeah, anyway. <laughs> what did you guys do to chat? 
yeah it's it, yeah i do think this is interesting about the the getters on plane objects i think we've seen this problem actually i think when the angular we're, we're dealing with a uh, um signals uh with dot value we saw this actually being a considerable issue um yeah yeah after optimizing that odd case yeah anyways i just i i don't like this discourse at all because it's like i'm not going to go bother build the 1.0 version it's all because why am i going to why am i going to do that oh guess it's still going Interesting. This suggests that start might have more overhead than I'm picturing. But we if we if we're gonna test that, we should test that in a better test. Actually, to be fair on his computer, he's close to remix and he's both using React. So yeah, I mean this is interesting. He's still ahead of next though. Oh yeah, that's true. If someone was mentioning that the solid version was the dev version, I don't know if that matters that much. Probably a little bit. I don't, honestly, you can start seeing when there's so many aspects and facets to this, why like it's not even, it's hard to even take any of it at, with any even remote value. Next might not even be the slowest. Like, like honestly, like, I remember when Steve from Builder put out his benchmarks and he went through like multiple iterations to get to a point where we were kind of finally maybe getting something semi in a good place. This test has has weeks before it, and lots of effort before it could get to anything that I could even make a bit of a conclusion from. Anyway, uh, that's all I really have to say about benchmarking. Um, anyways, uh, let me drink some water here. Was it Epic Comp Web Comp today? Yeah, yeah, or no, I guess it was yesterday, and now everyone's catching up with what happened on Twitter. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Um, I know you guys want to hear about my opinion of the signals uh, stuff, but as I, I, I think I covered it all with Jaden. I'm not gonna bother. Um, I'm not gonna bother. Uh, how should I put it? Uh, getting into the specific details of it at this point. I'm familiar with it. I've read it multiple times, but I've also like not spent the same level of thinking with it because these things take time. And like stage one is a good step. It means now we're at a point where people like acknowledge that this can be a thing moving forward and conversations will continue. And, you know, this will take a bit of time. So I'm, I'm okay with like, I, I vetted it as far as understanding that we can build what we want on top of it. But I don't have many opinions uh, beyond that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm glad. I mean, there's enough people, you know, wanting this. So I think I think it's a big step forward. We've had a hard time getting reactivity proposals into JS. You know, I always bring up that Brendan Eich thing where he's like, JavaScript's not a data flow language, you know. But you know, people are going to keep on pushing for it. So yeah, I, I don't I don't think yeah I don't I don't think I'm I'm gonna really have much more to go on on that. Um, let me just check my profile here for a second. Profile, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that, that's that's the takeaway. This is a win. 
Um, so, yeah. What time is it? It's about three o'clock. Yeah, that's not that's not bad. That's not bad. We did we did we did good today. Um, yeah, give me one more second here. I want to actually check on the Twitch stream how we're doing. Oh, Primogen is uh, streaming right now. Um, yeah, no, we're we're all good. Does anyone have any quick questions for me right now? I'm just getting set up for... Will signals come first and observers back? It's odd that observers are more... It's hard to say. I don't I don't know. It's funny. Me and Ben Lesh had this conversation, and he said observables are more general. And I can see that on one side, but they're also like... The, like it's very hard like you can say oh signals are behavior subjects but they're not like it's just a different look of what reactive programming is like it depends on what your truth is because for me when i look at signals and like the graph i think about a synchronization system and to me transformations live inside a sync like inside uh uh a synchronization system, not the other way around. You could also say that the uh, transformations are the inputs to a synchronizing system. So like, I, I don't know if one is more fundamental than the other, so to speak. I've tried to build signal li libraries on top of Rx primitives and it did not go very well. Um, that's how, Solid was kind of like that for a bit back in 2018, no, 17-ish. So I, I, it's, it's interesting. The challenge is that they've been trying to get observables in in a certain way and people are like why do we want them there is some benefits to signals but i i i don't know if we haven't seen it yet but i suspect we might start getting bigger pushback now that the it's a higher stage like some people might come out of the woodwork and be like i really dislike this proposal so we're gonna have to see how this goes so yeah um I talked a lot about some of the 2.0 stuff, you know, with my signals 2.0 stream that last last week. So I think I think um I think I think we're good. 